Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board for Monday, March 28th, 2022. This is Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy. With me tonight in the Select Board Chambers are John Hurd, Eric Helmuth, Adam Chapdelaine, Town Manager, Doug Heim, Town Council, Ashley Marr, Office Manager. And Mr. Diggins is with us remotely, and if you can confirm that you can hear us. I can hear you a little muffled, you know, so, um, but, but um, I can hear you fine with my headphones on. Okay, thank you. Um, tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with an act signed into law on February 15th, 2022, that extends certain COVID-19 related measures. The act includes an extension until July 15th, 2022, of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. Finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. We are continuing our warrant article hearings this evening, so let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. Uh, I'll now turn to the next item on the agenda, which is the consent agenda this evening. Item two is a request for a contractor drain layer license, John Pan Pandalina, J. Pandalina and Son, LLC. Item three is a request for a special one day beer and wine license for April 9th, 2022 at the Robbins Memorial Town Hall for a private event. Uh, do we vote? Okay. Second. Okay, any comments? Right. On a motion by Mrs. Mahan for approval, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourse? Yes. Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, next item, item four and five, they are appointments. Item four is for the Elderly and Disabled Tax Relief Review Committee, terms to expire 131 2025. With us tonight is Nancy Feeney. Rick Fenton and James Munsey. Um, and while they are brought up, what this is is back in 2017, town meeting approved a local option to establish an elderly and disabled tax relief fund. There are five members to the fund pursuant to Chapter 60, Section 3D, the treasurer, the chair of the board of assessors, and three um, members appointed by the select board. And the three... Um, applicants who have been recommended to us are here this evening um, and if you could each of you just identify yourselves briefly and uh, tell us uh, why you're interested uh, to serve on the committee. Let's start with you Ms. Feeney. Hi thank you very much. Um, I'm Nancy Feeney. I'm a new member of the Council on Aging and I'm looking forward to um, offering my services to help <clears throat> and um, going over the tax relief fund and offering grants money. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Fenton? Uh, did, you, did you say me? Yes. Uh, yes, hi, I'm, I'm Rick Fenton and uh, uh, I've been a board member for six years and I'm currently an associate board member and uh, been a volunteer for quite a while. And I'm very interested in, in joining with uh, Nancy and, and Jim to uh, help uh, decide in terms of the distribution of the tax relief funds. Uh, and so I'd very much like to do that. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Munsey, if, if you could go now. Good evening. Um, nice to see Rick again. We used to serve on the council board for six years. 
And I ditto everything that those two people just said. I've been working with the Council on Aging for, I'm in my 10th year serving our senior population. And it's uh, very gratifying. I look forward to the work with these two people too. Great, thank you very much. I'll turn to the board for motions or comments. Mr. Hurd. Just wanna thank all three of you for stepping up and in, in, uh, agreeing to serve on this committee. We've been looking forward to these to the elderly tax relief fund for a few years that it's been in place and i look forward to seeing what the committee can come up with to help our seniors so i'll move approval thank you second okay we'll second for mr helmuth any other comments if different board members seeing uh mr diggins i'll just say i mean i really appreciate what you all are doing it seems like the council on ages where all the cool kids are so i need to hang out there sometime <laughs> soon so thanks for stepping up you're too young <laughs> well, older than I look. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, and, and just to, to add, on the real estate tax bills, there is a check off, check off for this fund um, for, for voluntary contributions, and the committee decides uh, for those applicants who I, I believe there are applications available through the Council on Aging website and perhaps to the Treasurer's Office as well. Um, so on a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you to each of you for your willingness to serve. Thank you very much. Uh, right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item five is an appointment to the Grants Committee of the Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture, uh, Nancy Gray. waiting for Ms. Gray to come up. I do want to thank uh, the public. We, we are still, um, we're in a hybrid format tonight. I understand there might be some issues on, on audio with Zoom we're trying to work through. And uh, again, this is part of the experience of, of working in this new environment. And, uh, we'll do the best we can on it. Nancy, if you just want to unmute your mic. Unmute. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Gray. Yep. Hello. Can anybody hear me or see me? Uh, we can hear you. Okay. That'll be sufficient. Sure. Yeah. If you could just tell us a, a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in serving on the, um, on the commission, on the grants committee, rather. Yes. Oh, now we can see you. <laughs> um, I, have, I ran my own foundation uh, for about four and a half years. Um, it's the Nancy H. Gray Foundation for Art in the Environment. The people I gave grants to were ones with degrees in art, but had given a, um, a lot of thought to some part of an environmental issue. Um, and I ran it from um, 91, let's see, 91 to um, 91, no, 96, 97, 98. And uh, some, one of the wonderful ones was an artist who said, okay, a highway has come through in California in two different communities. Um, why don't we create a garden, community garden between these two and then they can intermingle like they used to in the old days before there was a highway. Um, and another woman cleaned up a beach on an island in Maine, and I thought she should continue with her work, and it has gone on for years. Um, another created um, a place for art in Philadelphia, um, which was just charming and right in the middle of a poor neighborhood. So those are just some of the things that I've um, given money for in my years as a grantor. Um, that's a while ago, but I stopped it in just as soon as the dot com boom ended, if you remember that. Great. Okay. Yep. No, sure do. No, thank, th and, and thank you for your interest in, in, in serving on the committee here. I'll, I'll now turn to uh, board members, if, uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work for the arts to support artists. They are, it is so important in the fabric of our community. 
Um, and I think artists have an especially important Wait, role. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Th yeah, sorry about that. Well, I'll, I'll try to talk louder. We're having some technical audio problems. Um, I was thanking you for your work to support artists and what an important role artists have in, in talking about important issues of our time like the environment. And I'm thrilled mm -hmm. that you will continue your work um, to help um, allocate grants for artists in our town. So I would be very happy to move approval. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Second. Uh, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Any further comments? Thank you. Um, seeing none, so we're going we're gonna to go to a vote now. We just want to thank you again for your interest, but on a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's a unanimous vote. Great. Congratulations. You've just been appointed, <laughs> and uh, thank you for your interest. I appreciate your time, too. Thank you very much for doing that for me. Sure. Okay. Uh, we will now move to warrant article hearings, and uh, we're going to pick, uh, pick up uh, numerically um, based on what's printed here on the agenda. Just a couple of comments before we start. Um, for presenters on the warrant articles, we ask that you uh, try to keep your presentation to seven minutes or less. These are all public hearings, and we ask that the members of the public who wish to be heard limit their presentations or their comments to three minutes um, uh, for, for any comments that they want to make. We've had some discussion at the last meeting and in, in, I believe on the first Warren article hearings that we had uh, about home rule and the limitations of home rule. We're going to get into that a little bit more this evening, um, and I may turn to Attorney Heim um, to talk a little bit about that as well. But uh, that is going to come up on the facial uh, recognition warrant article when we provide an update. It's also going to come up on the rodenticide article uh, as well. So we will um, try to address that um, when we get to those points. But I did want to make the, just the, the points on, on general timing. So why don't we start with Article 7. Bylaw Amendment, Youth and Young Adult Advisory Board, and uh, I believe we're going to turn it to Mr. Diggins to uh, make that presentation, and there might be some speakers on that one as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, yes, we're going to have two presenters, uh, um, uh, Mr. Franzosa, uh, Alexander Franzosa, and uh, Ms. Um, Josephine Almond. Okay, they're going to join us in just a moment. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Uh, good to see everyone here tonight. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, it says that it's disabled. Okay. Okay, Ms. Meyer is going to look into that. And just in case you have problems hearing, uh, I'm finding headphones help out a whole lot. So. All right, looks like I have access. Pulling it up right now for all. Okay, great. Can you all see this all right? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, so tonight we'll be presenting in favor of the Young Arlington Collaborative's formation. So a bit about who we are. I'm Alexander Frandosa, co-chair of the study committee, which was created from the 2021 Warren Article 17, uh, which called for the formation of a study committee for the creation of another committee in turn, uh, a youth and young adult advisory committee. So myself, uh, the other co-chair here tonight, uh, Josephine Almond and the rest of the committee have worked at this study to come with a suggestion for a final committee. A brief overview of the membership of the committee. We had 11 members, uh, a good mix I found of high school students as well as town government veterans, and then myself something in between the two. So looking into why we should create a group uh, here are some of the issues that we found most prevalent uh, and required to consider when creating this group. 
Uh, youth issues and youth activism have become increasingly prevalent in society. That is, young people want to get involved, and this would be an avenue for legitimate involvement uh, beyond just uh, campaigning on the streets. Uh, secondly, many important decisions made in local government do affect youth and young adults. Uh, the best example I can think of is school committee decisions absolutely affect students. Uh, in many cases in the town, students are the end clients of town services, uh, not only with the school committee, but the recreation department, for example. Uh, third, young people do have the potential to develop skills in town government. Uh, I see that this group could be an opportunity for interested youths, particularly younger people, to get interested uh, and get experience uh, working with that interest with real town government issues. And finally, representation in government, of course, is uh, absolutely necessary to, to make sure that every person has their voice heard and to ensure that laws are fair for all. In order to make sure that we created a group that, that made sense for Arlington, we decided to do some research on other groups in neighboring communities. Uh, we found that many communities in the Commonwealth from as far flung places as Newton to Salem had committees not unlike the one that we're creating. Some of these were ad hoc committees for the purpose of creating one specific event, while others were a permanent body, which would mirror more what Arlington is looking to do. Uh, I find and the committee finds that it's useful to have other committees that have already done similar work to our own, not only as precedent to show that it can be done, but also that those committees could be contacted by the committee to be formed um, for the development of new ideas and to share thoughts about common challenges between youth in different towns. So our decision after deliberating was to suggest the formation of the Young Arlington Collaborative. Uh, the name collaborative, I find, is a, a round word that is welcoming, especially to younger people who might not be uh, ready yet to, to get into a, a serious commitment, but, but have an interest. And, and what we're really trying to do is to feed into that interest. So the structure that we're working with here will be somewhat based off of the Envision Arlington model, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, in which there's a large standing committee uh, composed of 21 voting members, 21 non-voting members, and then beneath it, this is the Envision Arlington type style, there will be working groups that need not be formal members. Uh, this allows for a broad number of people to, to be involved in the group. And by having more inclusivity, we increase the chances of youth's voice is being heard within the group and then through the group to town government. Uh, and the working groups I find will, will allow for greater flexibility with the structure of this group. Uh, right now, we're just looking at how to get things rolling. The, the way that it will roll once it's formed uh, is really up to the group itself. Taking a closer look at some of the mechanics of the group and, and the membership, we wanted to have people from across the town in a diverse set of precincts be involved. Um, we also wanted a diversity of age groups. You may have noticed in the original article, uh, Article 17 from last year, which called for the formation of a committee or the formation of a study committee, pardon me, uh, was for youth and young adults. And we took this literally, that youth would be an age range from 12 to 20, so covering high school and young college age and young adults ages 21 to 35. And by having one youth and one young adult from each precinct, we ensure that there's a diversity of voices being heard. Um, the members will be chosen or selected and will be eventually selected by lottery. The terms are for two years and the voting members and non-voting members will switch each year based off of the respective precinct number. Um, so that might be an odd or even number They'll be voting or non-voting for youth or young adult given every other year. Um, and you can refer to, I believe it's in the agenda as well, the main motion as suggested for a closer look at some of the details there. There will be a liaison chosen by the select board who will serve as the secretary. And this will be a good contact point between the group and the select board itself. Um, the subsequent member selections will be subject to the decision of the collaborative itself to decide how those members are chosen. Uh, we set something up here to get the ball rolling. And again, what the collaborative ends up doing once it's in motion is up to them. So we've done a lot of talking about the structure of the group. 
here's the mission statement to get into some of the, the, the work that I and the committee would like to see the collaborative do. Uh, so I'll read it off here. The mission of the Young Arlington Collaborative is to invite the youth and young adults of Arlington to get involved in their local government. We will provide an inclusive space where we can collaborate with our community. Let all voices be heard. And what this is driving at is that this group will be a two-way communication channel, right? So for the youth and young adults who to date might not have seen a formal group where they're actually part of town government and can present to town government, say the collaborative could make a presentation for town meeting or make presentations to the select board. These youth would now have an opportunity to do so. Um, furthermore, it's not only a one-way communication channel, there's also the opportunity for town government officials to teach those in the youth committee about the way that town government works. I find that there's excellent opportunities for education here, as well as the empowerment of youth. So this mission statement, which would be something of the, uh, the billboard advertisement to get members to join and get interested, uh, is a good place to start as to what our work will be. Um, so with that, I'd like to wrap up here. I hope I've kept it within the time limits. Uh, thank you all for listening and myself and Joe are open for questions that you might have. Thank you. Great. Th thank, thank you very much for the presentation and, and for the, the work you did as, as part of the uh, study committee and lead, leading up to this recommendation. Um, I'll now turn to the board for any uh, questions, comments, motions. Um, I think maybe appropriate to start with Mr. Diggins on this one since he was so involved with it. Well, of course, I am going to make a motion to uh, uh, vote positive action on this. I mean, and I'm going to reserve um, comments until um, after the hearing and um, after the vote. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll help answer questions to, um, should sure. they come up. Okay. Any other member? Sure. Uh, Mr. Helmet. Thank you. I'm very happy to second this. Welcome back, Mr. Franzoso. We saw you uh, at our last meeting, I believe, uh, having joined the Community Preservation Act Committee as a young adult, and I'd say that you are uh, practicing what you preach by your involvement in that committee. Uh, thank you for your, for your help. I hear great things from the chair about your work there. Um, and I just want to say that uh, last week I had the opportunity to speak with a, a student group at Arlington High School that was, uh, work, works in government and politics. And with some help from Mr. Diggins, I, uh, on talking points, I described this proposed commission to them. And their response was, where do we sign up? They were really interested, really excited. And uh, so I will hope that we move this through the town meeting, and that town meeting gives you a resounding vote to create this, this group. Great. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Hurd. Thank you all for the presentation and your work on the committee. Um, I'm happy to support this. I think it's exciting to see what can come of it. I think last year, Mr. Diggins had an idea, right, Mr. Diggins? But when we first talked about it, we didn't know quite what it would be or what the group would accomplish, but he knew he wanted to get youth of Arlington involved and put a committee together. And I think the product that's come out of all the work that you all have done this year has come up with a group that will be very beneficial to both the participants and the town. So I'm very happy to support this, and I'm glad to see this coming together. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, Ms. Mahan? <clears throat> Sorry, I just have it. Um, thank you. I'm not going to repeat what my colleagues have said. I was just wondering, um, in terms of the uh, youth that you'll be encouraging to apply and that you've already done the outreach for and others, um, uh, I was just wondering for young adults on the sort of the high functioning end of special needs, um, wh where do you envision them? I'm not saying um, young adults, adolescents who aren't on the high functioning end um, don't have a, a spot on this committee, but I'm just wondering for that group, high functioning to low functioning, um, sort of where you see um, fitting them in, or is that something that's going to be discussed at the first few meetings and then make a decision on that going forward? Sure, if I could speak to that. Um, I think that the, the more inclusive the group, the better, right? And, and hopefully the, the working group model will provide as many opportunities for membership as possible. Um, and to your point, there might be room for decisions to be made 
uh, once the group convenes for the first time. Our, our mission here really was to get the ball rolling. And you bring up a good point that I hope, should the collaborative be formed, uh, will be considered in depth. Thank you. Very happy to support this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Th thank you, Mrs. Pond. Mr. Diggins? Yes, I, I was just going to ask Mr. Franzos or, or, or someone in Zoom land to uh, repeat what the question was because I didn't quite get it from Ms. Mahan. Ms. Mahan? Uh, I, I was just, um, this is sort of, pardon the pun, in its infancy, but the question was concerning um, youth with, uh, that run the spectrum um, on, on special needs, high oh, functioning yeah. to, you know, the whole gamut. I'm not trying to right. eliminate anyone. So right. that was the question. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. No, no, no. Okay. So I understand and now I understand um, my colleague's response. Great. My colleague's done the study committee response. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. That's Diggins. A, oh, go ahead. No, I just want to say that's a great question though, um, because our group does focus a lot on inclusivity and I really hope that it's something that the future group will consider more. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Um, yeah, and I also want to add, I'm, I'm happy to support this and, and appreciate the comprehensive nature of the uh, proposed bylaw here. Just one question, and, and perhaps it's for Mr. Diggins. Uh, there also was an Article 21 to extend the term of the study committee. If this is um, town meeting votes, favorable action, and creates the bylaw, is there any further need to extend the committee? Or And, and I'm wondering, maybe we should take a, a contingent vote in the highly unlikely event that there isn't a vote at town meeting, would you want to continue the committee? Um, if there, I think it's highly unlikely, if, but I just, just procedurally. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I, mean, I, mean, I, I guess uh, and maybe um, uh, Mr. Heim can, can um, address this. I mean, I mean, if we were to take this, this Article 7 to town meeting and town meeting had some issue with it, I would imagine that town meeting itself would create I mean, uh, the amendment that would allow the group to continue for a year unless town meeting just wanted to I mean, not have the group, period. I mean, but So if that's not the case, I mean, then we could do 21 just as a backup. I mean, but, but we had that just in case we couldn't uh, make it to the goal line. Uh, this this for for annual town meeting we got a bit of a late start you know but but uh, we were so close to me that we just pushed through and did a whole bunch more meetings because to prolong this for another year you know I, I just think it would be counterproductive because I mean, we wouldn't get much more out of it so okay. I hope right. that answers your question Mr. Chair all right yeah no we, well we need to make a recommendation that's why I was asking uh, Mr. Chapdelaine thank you Mr. Chairman I just thought maybe a will report Okay. Suffice. Sure. Okay. And that 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 way, when the, the chairman can get up and say, if for some reason Article Seven doesn't work out, here's our motion. Perfect. If it does work out, no action. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm not concerned it won't, but just in case, yeah. I, that's the way to do it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chaptolin. This is a public hearing, so I, I don't know if there's anybody who wishes to be heard on this article. No members of the public have raised their hand. Okay. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. So, on a motion by Mr. Diggins uh, for favorable favorable action. Uh, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Right. Thank you very much. Mr. Diggins. Yeah, yeah and, and I just wanted to say, because I didn't want to be, make it emotional um, or make the vote emotional, but I, I, I'm just really so proud of this group, me and, uh, uh, and, and not only the high school students and the, the young adults, there's the second one. Um, it was our DEI director, uh, 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 and um, uh, it was actually her first chance getting to vote in you know, any of the committees you know, that she's been a part of, and she was thrilled with that. You know, and, and also the liaisons from, from other groups. You know, and and I, I think this really gives me a lot of confidence that we're headed down the right path, because when I campaign, I mean, there was the, the notion that the select board just could have created a group like this. But then I thought it would be really be better if this were something that town meeting created. And bringing a bunch of people together to work on it, it ended up being something very different than I imagined it would have been. And I'm happy for that because I think I think it's a better a better um, I, it's better concept at this point. And I, I have no doubts that we, when uh, the group is committed, hopefully it will be, I mean, you know, with more people that it'll become um, even better. So 
So, um, so thank you all, but really thanks to everyone on the committee and all their hard work. But, no, and thank you for your hard work, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Attorney Heim, did you want to add something? Mr. DeCourcy, just before we uh, move on, uh, and this is just a minor thing, I just want to confirm that the intention of this is to place this in Title II committees and commissions under a new article, correct? Correct. So this will be codified correct. in the town bylaw. It won't be a creation. It'll be a creation of town meeting, but by the town bylaws, not as a standing committee of town meeting, correct? Correct. Thank you, sir. Correct, yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. great. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on, uh, we are next going to take up Article 13 again, uh, or continue our discussion on Article 13, a uh, bylaw amendment uh, to prohibit the use of face surveillance. I believe Mr. Fisher may be with us tonight. And just to update um, the public, we uh, this was the last our Warren article hearing that we had at our last meeting and uh, we got to a place where we had talked about pro potential preemption issues um, because of the GEAL Act and we also talked about potentially going down the road of a, um, of a resolution because of a commission report that was actually uh, came out on Tuesday, the commission report, um, which I, I have here, I wanna get the name, um, special commission to evaluate government use of facial recognition technology in the Commonwealth. Their final report came out on March, it was dated March 14th, but it was published last week. So in talking with Mr. Fisher on Friday, he has sent a proposed resolution to us um, as opposed to a bylaw change in light of the final report and our discussion uh, last week. So Mr. Fisher, if you wanna add anything on the proposed resolution and we'll take it up for, for board discussion. But I wanna thank you for reaching out to us after the meeting and, and thank you for a, what I consider a productive discussion last week as part of the Warren article as well. Sure, thank you so much. Um, just a couple things. Um, I guess, first of all, I, I think from my perspective, the, um, the issue that's pushing us towards a resolution is not state preemption, because I think that was worked um, into the proposed bylaw pretty pretty clearly that any change to the state law would have adjusted our town bylaw. Um, but more the issue around the Town Manager Act and the particular way that our government, uh, our town government is chartered. Um, and so I think, you know, a resolution uh, will be a, a positive action supporting and also sort of gently pressuring our state representatives to um, continue their work um, on facial recognition. Um, and, you know, I think on the side of town government, the resolution will provide really clear, if non-binding, direction for the town manager and town government. Um, and I think it's right for us as elected officials to follow the letter and the spirit of, of our town charter, um, even if we could theoretically maybe win a vote at town meeting creating a ban, but it, it's not, from what I understand from Mr. Heim and from you all who have who have helped me understand our town government, it, it doesn't seem like it would follow the letter of, of how our government was created. Um, and so while I'm, I'm, the only other thing I wanted to say was that while I'm generally sympathetic to a strong town manager, because I think government, especially local government is really good and can do more when its power structure is clearer and more direct. Um, I do find town meetings current inability to constrain town government to be somewhat problematic um, I understand that in theory, the check on the town manager is the select board and the check on the select board are the voters, but that remedy seems pretty indirect and slow and discounts the, the great power of incumbency. Um, so I, I understand you all are thinking about this. I've talked to Mr. Diggins a little bit about it um, and it's a tricky knot to unravel, but m my hope is that we can all find a way to allow for some potential to create guardrails for town government without reducing its ability to set policy. Um, so thank you very much. Okay, th thank you, Mr. Fisher. And be before I turn it to, to board members, to Mr. Fisher brought up that, that the second issue that we run into with preemption, and, and there's an issue of state law and, and what the legislature, whether there was an intent to preempt the field here, but uh, Attorney Heim had uh, brought this up in memos to us earlier on. There also is the interaction of the Town Manager Act with actions of town meeting. And if I could turn to 
Attorney Heim, uh, just briefly on that issue, I think Mr. Fisher summarized it, but um, just in terms of what we need to be mindful of when we have these proposed bylaws in terms of what's already spelled out in the Town Manager Act and uh, the limitations on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I want to thank again Mr. Fisher, who uh, I've enjoyed having a lot of dialogue with about uh, both the specific uh, uh, Warren article that he's brought, uh, but also about these larger issues. And I guess what I just want to convey to folks is that, yeah, when we talk about uh, preemption, typically what we're talking about is the idea of what powers have been delegated to towns and other municipalities under the Home Rule Proce Procedures Act. And there's a long history involved here, but the, the, there's two facets of it. One is about what powers a municipality, like a town or a city, can exercise relative to the state. And there's some very specific things we're not allowed to do, which is regulate taxation or regulate elections through local bylaw but also this very general clause that we're not allowed to regulate something that's already regulated by the state. But there's also a second part that we don't talk about as much, and it's that we're not supposed to regulate something that's inconsistent by a local ordinance, bylaw, um, city ordinance, that's inconsistent with what's essentially here in Arlington, our town charter. And the Attorney General's office, in theory, would take a look at that, but that's very difficult because every town has a slightly different form of government. And Arlington has a strong Town Manager Act, and it's very specific. There's also another piece of that that's a little bit more nuanced specific to Arlington because we have a sort of proto-charter. It's that the Town Manager itself actually is state law. The Town Manager Act is a collection of state laws that were passed, special acts, over a period of time before the Home Rules Procedure Act was passed. So it's kind of funny, but in a way, we're not only sort of dealing with the sort of constitution of the town and how it separates powers, but we're also dealing with a sort of very nuanced preemption issue in the sense that the legislature agreed that this is the type of government the town would have, and it passed these different um, modifications to the Town Manager Act over time. So I, I know that that's a mouthful. Um, it's a little bit hard to state too concisely, but if folks have more questions about it, I just want to recognize all of the folks um, who have brought some really important ideas before the board. Um, it's not a commentary on the quality of the ideas at all. It's a commentary on the way our government is, is set up, and it ranges everything from uh, the resolution that I believe we'll have before us tonight about diversity in town appointments to facial recognition technology to uh, integrated pest management uh, to varying degrees. And it can be sometimes a close question when it comes to interpreting the Town Manager Act, and I appreciate Mr. Fisher and the Select Board's um, patience and consideration of these matters. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, Attorney Heim. Um, so I, I'll now turn to board members. Any questions, comments? Uh, Mr. Diggins? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I have a question. My apologies, Mr. Heim, for me for not getting to you earlier. You know, it's just been really, really busy. And I didn't really want to interfere with you last week because I know you're busy um, doing um, reports for us. Uh, uh, but if you have the bylaws handy, I mean, I'm looking in Title I, Article 16, where we talk about construction projects. And, and I'm trying to understand I mean, why it is that that article doesn't conflict with the Town Manager Act. Because it seems to me like the Town Manager I mean, could do all the things that this article mean is is prescribing I, 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 yeah what 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 particular bylaw are we, so, are we referring to uh, it's on this channel one I mean, so it's article 16 on construction projects okay okay attorney Heim. so um thank you mr chairman thank you mr diggins this is a good question if you look at the town manager act the town manager act outlines the town manager's many duties and authorities and among them, and I believe I outlined this in the initial memo, and maybe I should have reproduced it for each Warren article hearing. It was just quite long. It was like seven or eight pages before we even got to the substance of the hearing. But if you look at Section 15G of the Town Manager Act, you'll see that there's some specific things that are sort of carved out relative to the town manager's specific authority and duty over um, the use of town property and uh, construction projects. So um, I'm, I'm quoting here, I'm sorry, most folks probably don't have Section 15G of the Town Manager Act in front of them, but it says, quote, except as otherwise voted by the town, 
uh, the school committee shall be responsible for the study of considerations and recommendations as to construction, reconstruction, alterations, improvements, and other into undertakings pertaining to school buildings, except as otherwise voted by the town. The town manager shall be responsible for the preparation of plans and the supervision of work thereto authorized by the town. Except as otherwise voted by the town, the town manager shall be responsible for the preparation of all plans and the supervision of work on all other reconstru construction, reconstruction, alterations, improvements, and other undertakings authorized by the town. So there's some very specific language inserted into the Manager Act about the manager's overall um, authority relative to construction, reconstruction, and alterations and improvements. And uh, town meeting has passed some bylaws that talk about, quote unquote, except as otherwise voted by the town, how they are essentially uh, expressing those qualifications in the Town Manager Act. So um, again, as I said, some of these things can sometimes be close questions, but some of it has to do with the fact that in order to engage in public construction, we're usually talking about a borrowing authorization or other things that require town meeting's approval. And some of these things are essentially conditions on town meeting's approval. The general management of the day-to-day -day operations of the town and day-to-day -day policy are a little bit different and generally involve um, uh, departmental functions where there is more uh, discretion vested in the town manager, where you'll see in section 15A of the Town Manager Act um, and section 15B. We talked a little bit about 15B the other day when we were talking about the power to create positions. There's very little qualification and it's extremely clear that the town manager is the only one on the town side of government that gets to create a position. So I'm sorry again for a long-winded answer. It's just hard to respond to, detail. to these important questions without going into a fair amount of detail. Right. Okay. No, that's great. That was great, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hyde. Yeah. Made, uh, so, so thank you very much. I, I, I get it. I get it. So, um, all right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. And, and before I get into further discussion, so, so Mr. Fisher had sent us a proposed resolution. There is some language in there, and then there, there are, are three items proposed to be resolved. And, and uh, the first one is to follow the recommendations of the Special Commission. The Special Commission had 13 recommendations um, that they issued with their report. And I, I do want to say specifically, they were focused on the, um, the, they devoted their attention to the law enforcement use of facial recognition and the possible further regulation thereof as a threshold matter. They did say in their report, however, um, and, and I'm just going to read these two sentences because I think it helps frame the discussion on the resolution. The commission is not in a position to recommend specific regulations on other government use at this time. It strongly recommends further consideration of this area following the implementation of the law enforcement focused recommendations contained in this report. And so what's contemplated there is they will move on to some of the other issues that Mr. Fisher um, perhaps that he raised, maybe they won't, we don't know where they'll go with it, but they certainly didn't see this as the, the final step. Um, also goes to the question of what their intent is in terms to regulate this field. Um, but there is a, a proposed resolution. I think we may not have all seen the language, but I think we could have a discussion tonight whether we would support a resolution that we can work on final language um, through Attorney Heim. So that's where perhaps we should uh, center the discussion for tonight's purposes. So anybody uh, who wishes to be heard, uh, Mr. Hurd. I'll move positive action on the proposed resolution to, and we can work out the final language. Um, I know in the, when we had the hearing last week, I was a little ambivalent on, on the request regarding facial recognition, but I certainly think we had a good presentation and in further research, it, I, I thank Mr. Fisher for his presentation and I think by the end of that discussion, if it wasn't 11 o'clock, I might have said this then that, you know, I was happy to support what he's doing with the article and I think it's a, in the form of a resolution, I think it's a good statement of values for the town. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Second? Second. Uh, second by Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Helmuth? Yeah, I, I thank you. I, I'm happy to support this. And I, I also want to express my appreciation to Mr. Fisher for his um, 
time and, and, and interaction and collaboration with us on this. Um, you know, I'm happy with this, and I don't know that this has to be the last stop, but I think that given that, you know, the town is not using this, even considering using this technology now, um, given that we, I, I would like to, I think perhaps with my colleague, Mr. DeCourcy, like to see what the legislature does with this commission's report on what, if to further clarify their intentions about, about um, addressing the field. Um, and, and I think it would be useful to get town meetings um, views on this. And, um, you know, I think depending on where it goes, depending on what the legislature may or may not do, you know, we, maybe we do want to revisit this in the, in the short term future. Um, one of the things that I was concerned about was just that we take enough time. If we're going to ask, invite town meeting to make policy, uh, notwithstanding whatever issues there may be with local preemption with the town manager act, uh, I think if we do that, that we need to really take the time to have a, a full uh, process with weigh in from everybody, uh, availing ourselves of all the expertise that we have, both with the people who work for the town, people outside the town, and I think um, we have a little bit of time to do that if we need to. Um, so that's another reason why I like where we've landed right now. I think it's a really good place uh, to land and maybe as a starting place, but um, so that's kind of my thoughts on it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. And um, also, I want to point out that our Representative Rogers was a member of the commission as well, so he would be a good resource yeah. um, to talk to about the um, where they came out and perhaps any future work. Um, okay. So um, I don't see any further hands. So on a motion uh, for approval by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. Uh, oh, Ms. Mar oh, well, yeah. So. It, it, I don't, here's the thing on this. We, we had the public hearing last week. I view tonight more as a continuation of our deliberation on it. So um, I wasn't planning on taking public input um, given that we had it last week. Perfect. Or, or at our last meeting. Just wanted to make sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so on a motion uh, by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Heim. And Mr. DeCourcy, just to make sure I understand my instructions here, I'm to work with Mr. Fisher's resolution. That's what the uh, uh, motion is on for Mr. Hurd, correct? Correct. Right, yeah, and, and we will work on final language. I, I, okay. But I think that's our starting point uh, Thank you. on that. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Great. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Okay. Now, the next is Article 14, vote to establish a committee on insurance costs and issues. And uh, Mr. F another Mr. Fisher will be joining us tonight, and hopefully he was successful with his root canal from uh, mm. earlier uh, at the beginning of our Warren article hearings. And then this is Andrew Fisher who's joining us for this. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening, Mr. Fisher. Good evening. I, 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 kept, I kept rejoining. I don't know if I did something wrong or what. Uh, well, well, thank you for recovering. rejoining. We can, we can see you now. I'm still recovering from a heart attack because I joined a little late right when you were saying that Mr. Fisher is here. And I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Sh shall I go ahead? Go right ahead. Thanks. Um, uh, th thanks for your time reading material I've sent you and hearing this article tonight. Oh no, what's that? What is this? I'm sorry? I, I did not, where, how did you find that? I did not submit that. I, I seen on my screen self-insuring Arlington first steps. Um, I think that was submitted that was before so... the very first hearing, um, and we just had it. Okay, as part I, of I don't intend. I, I don't intend to use that. I'm going to be very brief. I'm, I apologize. Okay. All right, no uh, problem. We can take that take that down and 
Yeah, go right ahead. Okay, I, I can see you now. Uh, okay, the, the update is that uh, I'm gonna do this project with the Citizens Engagement Group of Envision Arlington. So I, I don't need to ask for a, uh, a, an actual separate committee for the project. Um, the project being to conduct a survey of Arlington's total auto and property insurance costs of premiums and claims, as well as investigate various issues related to insurance. Um, I would like to ask if you think, if you will support a resolution endorsing this investigation into our insurance costs to learn if there really is so much inefficiency in our system that it would make sense for towns and cities to offer a self-insured community-based public option. Is there enough waste in today's system that a statewide self-insured network with community-based plans could pay for both claims and a substantial portion of the town's prevention services, meaning part of police and fire departments budgets? This might be possible given that each of Arlington's small precincts pays about a million dollars a year for auto insurance. And this I think is a low estimate. The change to self-insurance could mean actually changing norms about what we expect of insurance and what we expect the premium to accomplish. Does insurance promote the unity and financial strength of the town of towns and cities? Could it provide greater service as a community function compared to what it offers today? Uh, I expect the first steps of this project are to conduct a pilot survey for one precinct. Based on those results, we would refine the survey and can canvas another uh, couple of precincts and so on. The results could show that the current system delivers great value. And uh, end of story. Uh, it could lay the groundwork for establishing that, that uh, self-insurance system needs to be considered. I wanted to uh, close with a couple of comments. One is that um, we'll be looking at established self-insured plans and how they work. British Columbia has 3.2 million cars, which approaches the number of cars Massachusetts has, 4 million. Um, their sales is accomplished through a contract with the uh, British Columbia Brokers Association. Um, some 900 offices handled all of their sales. And uh, in, in 2019, they earned uh, $490 million in commissions. So much of the same infrastructure would exist. Um, probably the current companies would shift over to being third party administrators. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to say, uh, some of this boils down to does the public have the right to shape how we do the uh, social contract? Insurance policies are social contracts. They are actually carve outs of the social contract at large. And it happens that they will only manage the easy risks. If you have an oil spill in your basement and you have comprehensive insurance, it's like uh, the words mean nothing. The oil spill is not covered. There are other examples of this. So I, I wanted to be very brief. Um, that's, that's basically it for now. Okay. Thank, thank you for considering this. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fisher. I'll now turn to board members, questions, motions, comments, anybody? Uh, Mr. Hurt? Based on Mr. Fisher's Presentation, I'll move no action on the article. Okay, thank you. Do we have a second? Uh, um, second, and if we could just include in the remarks um, the first several sentences that Mr. Fisher explained that this is going to be incorporated. Um, it's going to get done, but by a different vehicle. If we could just include his four to five sentences beforehand. That, that feels thank appropriate. You. Okay, and this is a public hearing. Do we have any uh, members of the public that wish to be heard on this article? No members of the public at this time. Okay. All right. So on a um, motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, uh, Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. 
Mr. Helm? Yes. Mrs. Mon? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's 5 0 vote. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Article 15, Bylaw Amendment, Noise Abatement. And again, this is a continuation of a discussion that we had. I believe we had a vote on this, too. Did we have a, a, a preliminary vote on this? Where, or maybe there was a discussion about notice uh, issues on this. Attorney Hine? Mr. Chair, my recollection, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but was that the board wanted us to come back with a discussion that was guided by some language about what a notice might look like. Right. I apologize if that if we got to a place where this is supposed to be a sort of vote and comment, but I didn't I didn't think we wrapped it up yet. I thought yeah, we, we were, might not have. I, I thank you for that clarification. So I, I I drafted something to try to insert into Mr. Schlickman's overall um, sort of uh, Warren article uh, for the board's consideration. Uh, basically a new provision, a butter notice. Um, so I, I left open, just for folks' edification, the distance mm -hmm. and the number of days in advance that a, that a notice might have to. Do you want me to say a word about how I envision this functioning? I understand this sure. is Mr. Schlickman's article. I'm sensitive to that. I, I, I don't want to speak over Mr. Schlickman, who's the proponent. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, it's our recommendation on, on this provision. I think we got to a notice that, that's what we wanted to hear back on. So I, I think it's, it's fine if you want to go ahead and just um, let us know what, uh, d d talk a little bit further about the language. Of course. So essentially, um, there's essentially, a, there's a qualifier put on the authorized exemption for public and private way projects that just inserts the clause following transmission of an abutter notice as set forth herein. That's basically the only adjustment to part A. And then there's a sort of subparagraph that says, and a butter notice is going to be required uh, for non-emergency public work or utility projects um, on public or private ways outside of the allowed hours, and that it can be satisfied by mail, hand, or electronic delivery of a notice basically setting, you know, the date and time and the expected nature of the work being permitted by the town manager under the exception. And it sort of leaves blank, you know, what do we think in terms of a butter is how you want to do the traditional like 300 feet, um, that's a lot of, that can be a lot, it can be very few, um, it depends on the area of Arlington. And how many days in advance? One of the things I like about the way this is constructed is that it doesn't necessarily mean that the notice could go out before the manager, it might not be the best use of resources, but before the manager decides whether they're going to allow the work or not. If it's a really pressing thing, and DPW or a you know, utility needs to get it out there, they could say, hey, we're noticing you that we've requested this permission for this work during these hours. The manager might say, okay, that sounds good. The manager might decide, hey, let's, let's not put these notices out until after I've already decided that it's okay. But I can understand that sometimes the deadlines for these things can be a little bit tight. And so, you know, you might want to have that flexibility uh, I also understand that part of what Mr. Schlickman is asking for is, hey, look, if this project is really going to be disruptive, I want to be able to talk to somebody about it before it happens because I think that this does, shouldn't, shouldn't happen during, you know, the exempted hours. Um, or that, you know, I want to see if the select board will say something to the manager about it um, in advance and maybe withdraw that uh, permission if the, uh, if the manager initially gave it. So I'll leave it to the board to see if you like this. If you don't like it, fine. Uh, but how many days in advance and what sort of radius you'd like to provide. It's just one way of trying to skin this particular cat. Okay. And, and again, this is for non-emergency work, so it's, it's, you would think there would be some time uh, in advance. Um, I do see Ms. Mr. Schlickman is... Um, with us th this evening. I don't know if you've seen that language, Mr. Schlickman. I mean, it's, it's again, this is more of a board deliberation, but I had Mr. Fisher come back on the uh, face surveillance, so I don't know if you've seen this or if you have any comments, further comments for the board, but when we did um, have the hearing with you, I think we were all understood the concern that you raised about uh, the need for notice for some of these projects. I'm very appreciative of the work of council. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm certainly willing to work with, uh, with the town to, to get it done in this manner. Great. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, any comments?
comments from board members? There were two open items that Attorney Hine left the, the number of feet for abutters and the, the number of days. So, uh, Mr. Helmut? Just a, a question um, to the town manager through you, Mr. Sure. Chair. Um, if you have any um, concerns about th this framework is laid out and any specific suggestions for how we might fill in those blanks that would be practical and also sensitive to the uh, protections for residents. Absolutely. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to Mr. Helmuth. Um, I think the easier one is to suggest 500 feet. I think that's a number we've used quite regularly for other construction projects. Uh, I think about the high school when we've notified abutters about construction impacts. I think we've used a 500 foot radius. Um, for days in advance, I feel like two days is workable. Um, the challenge is until you get too close, sometimes it gets canceled or sometimes it gets postponed. So you don't want to, sometimes it's hard to give more notice than that because of the vagaries of weather or whatever might happen, and then you might have to notice again. Um, so I, I would say two days and 500 feet, if that f sounds amenable, but you know anything within that range, I think, is workable. And then, um, and thank you. And then, you know, I think per, per, per the comments in the memo from our town council, you know, one of the functions of this could be that the town manager could take the resident feedback upon receiving notice and decide not to do the project or to do it during the daytime. Do you feel like that uh, knowing the operations as you do that two days would be enough time to change those plans and receive that comment and kind of change course kind of on the, on the flip side of that, of that question? I mean, it's enough time to cancel the work. Yeah. Right. right. It's not it, like you can always pull the plug. Yeah. If, if ultimately the feedback is such that work that we thought was going to be best performed at night mm -hmm. is not going to be tenable at night. Mm -hmm. It'll mean that more planning will have to be done. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's doable, but it probably, you know, it, I guess maybe another way to say it is, it doesn't mean that it'll get done the next day during the day, right? It might take some further planning to figure out how, how to do it safely during that, those daytime hours. And if it were an emergency, of course, you could authorize it anyway. Right. So, yeah. right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. Um, oh, do you want motions right now? If you'd like to make one, sure. Yeah, so I'd like to move approval uh, of the proposed uh, amendments outlined in town council's memo with the um, numbers that were suggested by the town manager. 500 feet in two 500 days. 500 feet. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. A second by Mr. Hurd. Any further comments of board members? Uh, Mr. Dickens? Yeah, I just have a question um, through you to um, Mr. Slickman. Uh, so, um, so Mr. Slickman, when, when you were talking about I mean, the three times that this has happened in 10 years, I mean, and, and you were saying that this is kind of regular. I mean, and I was saying, well, it's 99.9% it's .9 of the time it's, it's not an issue. And I was using the denominator of the days of the year. So my denominator was like 3,000. I mean, was your denominator like 10 years? So like you're looking at it like three, three years out of 10 years, and that's how you got to regular? Because I was just trying to understand how it was that we had such different notions of, of the frequency of this issue. I mean, if this is an annual occurrence, and, and, and it's disturbing to this level, I, I'd say it's frequent. Um, especially when you go and try to uh, make it known that this is a problem, you try to tighten up the bylaw, and it still happens. Uh, you know, uh, notice is really an important part, I think, because you know, inevitably this has happened on a night where it's just a beautiful summer night where it's about 65 degrees and it's, oh, it's a great night to leave the windows open. And next thing you know, you're on the floor because you're thrown out of bed. Um, total surprise. Uh, emergencies happen, you know, and I live in a busy street. I got an ambulance company on the next block and the police station two blocks down. You still a lot of noise. That's okay. Ambulances go by, police go by, fire trucks go by, trucks go by, lots of stuff happens. You know, it's, it comes to the territory of living in a convenient place in the middle of Arlington. But when something really extreme happens, like jackhammers or those suction things in the sewers, uh, that's way beyond any expectation. And, and it, 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 it's, it's a violent wake up that really is very dis disconcerting. Uh, it's frightening even. So two days is enough time for you? Two day, yeah, two days is fine. I mean, you I, know, uh, it, that, that puts two barriers up, you know, that you've got time to go and say, do you really need to do this? And, you know, you can close the windows or maybe schedule a trip to Maine. 
or 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 make some kind of arrangement, not just be uh, know it's going to happen. Okay. Knowing okay. it's going to happen uh, is you, you can throw in a white noise machine, close the windows, uh, play the BSO. I don't know. Um, there, there there are ways there are ways to uh, uh, to be prepared for something like that if you know what's going to happen. Gotcha, Mr. Slickman. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, okay, so on a um, motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded. Actually, before I do that, consistent with what we did on the facial recognition, we already had the public hearing aspect of this. This is more of a deliberation, so I'm going to go right to a vote. Um, on a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mr. Hurd, uh, to insert the abutter notice provisions. Attorney Heim. Mr. Chair, do you mind if I just uh, clarify with Mr. Helmut that two business days is, is what we mean by two days? Is that all right? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Okay. Good. Thank you, Mr. Shortman. Thank you. Next, Article 18, bylaw amendment, phase out of certain toxics, rod rodenticides, on public private property with reporting requirement and public education. Um, I believe we, there will be a presentation on this. Um, Ms. Crowder, I believe, is with us this evening. Question, Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, Ms. Do you, um How do you plan to address Article 77, which is yeah. related to that? Sure. Yeah. Why don't the, I think the pre, well, yeah, the presentation actually is going to cover both. So we'll take Article 77 out of order. Take it together. Thank, thank, thank you. Article 77 is a resolution establishing a proposed resolution establishing an integrated pest management policy for town land, prohibitions, and public education about rodenticide hazards. Uh, good evening, Ms. Carter. Yes, I can hear you. Yep, go, go right ahead with your presentation. Okay, uh, my name is Elaine Crowder. I'm a, TM, a town meeting member from Precinct 19. And uh, Carrie? <clears throat> yeah, uh, Carrie Teal uh, on Lakeview Street in Arlington. Uh, so um, in Articles 18 and 77, we are trying to thread a particularly complex uh, set of needles. I might use my own version of this, um, so just hold off on, on displaying it yet. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll display it. Um, and we are trying to solve a local problem that affects human health and wildlife. And I'll let Carrie uh, begin to give a little bit of the background of how we uh, develop mm -hmm. these articles. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Carrie Teal, I'm very grateful to uh, speak before the board today. Um, I come at this issue personally from an animal welfare perspective. I have a background in, in doing policy development on animal welfare issues. And so I, I was concerned when I heard about the death of, of the eaglet. Wildlife issues are personally important to me. Uh, I had reached out to uh, Mr. Heim over a year ago and uh, told him that I was interested in developing something on this issue for the town to, to consider. Uh, he referred me to town meeting member Crowder, who has done unbelievable work on this and really become an expert. So I've been very blessed to have her as a partner on this. You know, our goal was to identify a set of policies around this issue that uh, were legally viable uh, and taking into account both the Town Manager Act, and also that there is a state law that restricts uh, what local communities can do to combat this problem. Um, things that would have a positive impact and that, that fit Arlington and made sense for Arlington. And so we had uh, many conversations over a series of months with, with uh, town leadership. And, and I'm, I'm really grateful for uh, not only Mr. Heim, but Jenny Rach and Feeney, Natasha, and her incredible team at the Board of Health, uh, and everyone, so this was a collaborative process for us. Uh, and at the end of that, we, we are bringing to you uh, a set of policies that does the following. Number one, it requires uh, uh, companies to report when certain rodenticides are used in the town uh, to the town. 
uh, that is something that apparently is not restricted by uh, the state by state law. Uh, second, and, and Elaine will go into great depth on all of these points. Um, second, um, uh, we're encouraging the town to do educational work on this issue. And there's already tremendous educational work happening. In, in fact, we're talking to all these town leaders, I was so impressed by the work that's already being done on this issue. And we're really trying to create just more tools uh, that will help. Um, third, uh, the creation of an IPM policy, which can only be, be done as I understand it, uh, via the town manager uh, issuing a policy. And so at the conclusion of this warrant article process, it's our hope uh, to work with the town manager uh, to do that. And then finally, uh, we do in these in these warrant articles phase out the use of rodenticides completely. Uh, I just want to touch on that and then I'll close. Um, it is possible this will be uh, rejected by the Attorney General. Uh, I'll go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, it's po it is possible that that the, the, that final piece, the phase out, will be rejected by the Attorney General. That's a possibility. And Doug and I had very constructive conversations about that possibility. Uh, I, I do think there are some things in, in our proposal that are different than the, the similar items that have come before the Attorney General previously. The fact that this is a phase out to 2024, the fact that there are exceptions uh, may make the AG think twice on this. Uh, if the AG does uh, uh, reject this particular component, the other pieces would not be harmed uh, and, and the town would have the option of uh, appealing that, that specific decision if it chose to. Uh, one thing that's interesting is that the town of Chilmark a decade ago brought a similar uh, local ordinance. It was rejected by the attorney general. They did appeal it. Um, they, they believe they had a very strong case. And during the appeal, the pesticide industry essentially blinked and agreed to uh, a special law addressing, addressing this issue and allowing the Chilmark provision uh, to remain in place. And so I, 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 I think that's interesting, um, but it certainly wouldn't commit the town in any way. So I, I think these are a good set of reforms. They're well thought out. I think they'll have a positive impact. And I would ask all of you for your favorable support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thiel. Uh, Ms. Crowder, did you want to add anything or is that? Thank you, Carrie. Um, yes, I, I will share my screen now. Do I have the sharing capability here? You should. Okay. Um, <clears throat> All right. Has it, is it showing? Not yet. Now it is. Okay, so just a sec. I have to rearrange my screens because I don't see it. <clears throat> um, and I will start the show here. Everyone can see it? Yes? Uh, not yet. It's blank screen right now. It's blank screen? Okay. Yes. Hmm. All right, I will try sharing one more time. Okay. If, if we have the same presentation, could, no. could, can we do it? It's, it's not exactly the same, but oh. I, I, I might just I might just do it without it if, it, if it's not going to show. Yeah, I could just wing it. That's all the space. Okay. Do you see it now? Now we see it. Okay, I'll just I'll just do it from this. It seems that uh, show screen is, uh, uh, running it is causing a problem. So um, we already know a, a bit about the uh, the wildlife that we are hosting in in Arlington, the Arlington eaglets that are nesting in Arlington, and uh, the problem that happened with this little guy here um, of uh, 
ingesting enough rodenticide to kill it by the time August came around. Um, it's not as well known that we also have rodenticide issues that are um, affecting human health. In East Arlington, um, we had a, a, a squirrel that a resident saw. She uh, woke up one day and found eight bags of first strike soft bait on her lawn. And uh, this is a second generation rodenticide. Um, she found that she took a picture of the squirrel that was sitting happily eating it in a tree. And uh, these are um, rodenticides that are placed in bait boxes that are supposed to be tamper proof, but, but the squirrel managed to get by that. And of course, she was very concerned about the neighbors, uh, neighbors' kids, that this was causing a problem for human health. The uh, escars continue to threaten human health, according to the EPA as well. Uh, this is a chart from EPA's human health risk assessment, um, 2017. And um, we can see that this top red line, although it's trending down, is, is the escar uh, incidence of human poisoning. And at about 5,000 incidents, it's over half of the total incidence of human poisoning, and it is five times more than the next most common, which is the anti non anticoagulants. So, in addition, um, the uh, so just a second. <laughs> So what you might, um, so unfortunately, um, the mechanisms for preventing such incidents are not particularly robust. Uh, in this case, the human, uh, the Board of Health uh, was called and um, didn't really have a whole lot uh, that it could do in this case um, with the neighbors that could talk to the management company of the neighboring apartment complexes. It could um, uh, uh, make them aware of the issue, but there really isn't the mechanism for being able to say, uh, it, let's not use poison in this particular instance. Um, it, the Board of Health can make a suggestion, but uh, not really uh, have any kind of, of, a, of a local control uh, effect. Right. I, yeah, and, and, and Ms. Crowder, if I, if I could, because we're getting up to about 10 or 11 minutes, I, I just want to clarify, and, and Mr. Thiel had, had mentioned this, you had submitted written materials to us, and there's basically three things you're looking for through um, Article 18, right? One is the phase out, two is requiring a written notification to the Board of Health whenever certain rodenticides are being used within the town, and three is, is an educational component. Um, the sure. Um, so if, it, it, it's those three items, because I, I would like to hear from the public and hear from board members too, but just to, to summarize, it's those three those, those are the three items in the proposed bylaw. We don't have a specific bylaw language from you, but we do have the three overall points. Is that, is that fair to say? Yes, that's we correct. Did, we did provide uh, Mr. Heim with draft language as well, and we're going back and forth with him on that. Okay. Okay. All right. So why don't I turn to board members at this point for any questions? I know there's members of the public that want to be heard as well. So start with questions from the board, and then we'll go to the public if, if any members have any questions at this time? Okay. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Um, thank you for your work on this. And uh, you know, we've met a couple times in the lead up to this. Um, and I appreciate your efforts. Uh, I have a question. I think my questions really revolve around, you know, I'm inclined to, to move in this direction. I think I've been, not just the presentation tonight, but the preponderance of, 
of learning about this. Um, but I think one of my questions is really the best way if the town and if town meeting wants to let me move this mic closer. Um, town meeting, you know, wants to restrict the use of the of SCARs on private property. The best way to do it. And I know that uh, you know Mr. Teal outlined, you know, one one strategy would be to put this in a bylaw that we're pretty sure would um, would get an off the cuff uh, rejection that in that part by the AG because of the preemption in state law. Um, and I guess my question may be for the town council, Mr. Chair, or the town manager, your discretion is if, you know, <coughs> your views on that as a strategy compared to a home rule petition that we could um, invite or suggest the town meeting would file um, to do that, if you could kind of compare and contrast both, both approaches. Um, understanding, I think that the end result, you know, is, is unpredictable um, because of the preemption in state law. But I guess what I'm looking at is what's the best way to make the point, you know, to have a chance to make a, a public point, maybe apply some pressure uh, to people who would oppose it and, and get perhaps a, a positive result similar to the one that Mr. Teal um, cited in another community. Uh, Attorney Heim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask about what is the better strategy from a political standpoint. Um, I'll defer to folks who are more experienced in working with the legislature than myself. Uh, you don't necessarily have to choose either or, um, but uh, I think Mr. Thiel summarized it well, which is that when we submit a bylaw to the Attorney General's office, we should and, and we're fairly confident they're going to reject it, we do have an opportunity to appeal. I don't know how, I, how good I feel about the odds of success on something that's relatively straight uh, uh, forward in terms of a pretty clear preemption mm -hmm. issue. It's not really a close call, if you will. Yeah. Um, the other facets of the bylaw, uh, I think, are very creative and well designed in terms of the licensing scheme, um, reporting scheme, things like that, that are adding something to what the state law sort of provides, but not telling people in one community you're allowed to use a certain rodenticide, but in another community you're not. So I think they kind of serve different functions, to be frank with you. I think that, and I think that Ms. Crowder and Ms. Mr. Thiel are, are and welcome to talk about that as well. But I'll let the manager speak to whether he has any insights. The only other thing I guess I'd say is that we do it, just generally speaking, my experience with the municipal law unit is we should pick our spots when we want to say we're, we're submitting at least, if you were to take positive action in this direction, mm -hmm. we would probably be submitting two votes this year if successful at town meeting that would be at least courting a challenge to the preemption on very different issues, mm -hmm. uh, our sort of multi-person domestic partnerships on one hand mm -hmm. and uh, this on the other. So it's something that I just think that we should be thoughtful about when we're going to do it and how often. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have anything to add? Mr. So, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to Mr. Helmuth. I, I would only add, I, I think town council's right that it doesn't have to be one or the other. I think strategically, I'll choose, try to choose words carefully, I think the bylaw to the AG process is more administrative and internal and thereby doesn't necessarily get public attention around the issue. Whereas a home rule petition, we would assume would have a hearing before the state legislature, or at least before a committee, where members of the, the community and maybe even the select board could go testify before the legislature. And it also, it doesn't mean there's a lot more attention, but there could be, mm -hmm. right? And it could raise the profile of the issue. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and uh, some further questions um, to town council, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, are you comfortable with the severability of the bylaw that if the AG tosses out, at least in its, in its administrative review, you know, tosses out the regulations on private property, the rest of the, of the article proposal bylaw would stand? Mr. Chair, thank you. Yeah, I, I always think that's wise, Mr. Helmuth. I mean, I think we've got a couple of instances here where you want to take a special care to craft a bylaw that will make sense if a portion gets stricken. But yes, as a general idea, I think that the licensing uh, if you're asking me if we submit this bylaw with both of these facets of this proposal, a phase out and a um, licensing scheme, I do want to make sure I understand the phase out well. But um, 
if it was the phase out piece of it was sort of stricken by the Attorney General's office, I think the licensing scheme could stand alone and make sense if we construct it the right way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then my final question, I think, is back to the proponents. Um, it, it really goes back to my first question, uh, which is, you know, you're suggesting that, that we do it this way to, to um, put, it, put it in the bylaw that with the anticipation of having to appeal. Um, instead of a home rule petition, I wonder if you had any comment on, on the home rule petition as a, as a strategy instead. Mr. Teal, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we were trying to find a balanced approach that, that, that gave the town several tools to address this uh, that, made, that made sense. And so, you know, I, I, I think the reporting requirement is, is a, a very beneficial a change. Um, I, I think the, the educational work um, and encouraging that is important. Uh, the one, maybe the most important piece uh, to me uh, is the adoption by the town manager at some point, presumably after this process, of a policy. And so, you know, I think Elaine and I are already looking forward and trying to figure out, uh, you know, and, she, and she's provided written, written comments about even, even as detailed as some specific models that we can use to go about crafting that in a collabor collaborative process uh, and bring it to the town manager for his consideration. I know that's not before us today, but it is referenced in, in the resolution, and it's a really important piece of, of the puzzle for us. Um, you know, I, I, I understand no one wants to challenge state preemption, even though, as someone who has challenged state preemption in different contexts, one, I understand why that's, that's never a preferred option. Uh, I, I do think that there's so much uh, passion uh, just among uh, Arlingtonians for this issue that, that taking a stand and saying, you know, we should have local control when Eagle died in our community on this and kicking it up to the AG and seeing what happens and, and then deciding, you know, it doesn't appeal makes sense or not. Uh, I, I do think that's appropriate and, and, and appropriate in the broader context of, of this larger package. Um, it's also worth noting that there is a bill in the legislature that would uh, abolish that preemption. And for all we know, that bill could pass by the time uh, the 2024 effective date comes, comes into it, you know, comes around. So I, uh, you know, I, I think we were simply intending to create uh, a toolbox of tools here that, that fit the town and, and would help and make sense. Okay. I hope that answers your question, Mr. Chair. It, it does. Thank you very much. That's all my questions for now. I think that after we hear from the public, I may have some things to say on the merits as well, but I was kind of going to get some of those mechanics out of the way. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, before I go to the public, any other comments from board members? I, I, I'm, I'm going to make a couple comments. Um, and, and this goes to the first aspect of, of your um, proposed bylaw. And I've had a number of discussions with Attorney Heim. Um, I, I think the preemption question is very clear on, on, on this. And, and the Chapter 132B, which is the, the Mass Pesticide Control Act, Attorney Hyman, I've talked about it, but the, the, the final sentence of, of Section 1 of, of that act says, the exclusive authority in regulating the labeling, distribution, sale, um, in, in disposal of pesticides in the Commonwealth shall be determined by this chapter. That's, that's what we would call, that's classic express preemption. We had this issue earlier with the facial recognition, whether there was implied preemption because it wasn't specific statutory language. It couldn't be clearer uh, here in, in, in my mind, but the, the article or the, the bill that you're talking about, I believe is House 910, which would create a local option. That's, that's pending in the legislature right now. So that to me is even further evidence that the legislature is controlling this field, um, at least on the regulation. And, and so I, I, I think it makes sense to parse out two and three, but, and again, I want to hear from the public, hear from you further, but to me, one's a non-starter in terms of us trying to do something through a bylaw because of, the, because of state law. Um, and and um, not to throw a lot of cold water on this, but I mean, I think it's it just, we had a discussion last week about the Constitution. This, this is a matter of the Massachusetts Constitution too. The, the Attorney Heim mentioned the, the Home Rule Amendment. That's Article Nine to our Constitu Article Eighty Nine to our Constitution. We're bound to follow that. So, I, before we got too far down the road, I, I just want to make my feelings felt on that. Not, not, you know, whether it has nothing to do with the merits. It's just how the legislature has determined they want to regulate this. Um, so, with that, 
uh, if there are members of the public who wish to be heard. Uh, Mr. Diggins? Yeah. Well, so, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. But, but we also have the, the, the issue with the Town Manager Act preemption, right. too, right? I mean, so, so, I mean, so then I understand that the resolution kind of gives us the same thing. It, it gives us I mean, points two and three I mean, in resolution format. I mean, so, so it, I, um, I don't know. I mean, um, we understand the desire to um, make a point. You know, I mean, I'm fine with that. I mean, but, but, um, I mean, but in, part, in terms of doing stuff, things in town, I mean, it's really up to the town manager. And it seems like we are well down the road of um, working with the town manager on it. It seems like the town manager is amenable to, um, to doing an IPM. Am I right about that, Mr. Manager, through you, Mr. Chair? Yep. Mr. Ch Mr. Chapterling's nodding. Yep. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, that, that's accurate, Mr. Diggins. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Teal, would you like to say something there? Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, uh, Chair, uh, Mem uh, Board Member Diggins, um, as these two warrant articles are currently drafted, uh, and I, Mr. Heim can confirm or deny this, but it's my understanding uh, that there is currently no issue with the Town Manager Act as they're currently drafted. Um, the, in fact, the, the reason why 77 is, is a resolution as opposed to a bylaw is our preference would be to have a requirement for town IPM policy in bylaw. However, we're not doing that with this warrant article. Instead, a town meeting would be essentially asking the town manager to consider adopting a policy, which he, of course, has the right to do. And that, that, that was, you know, one specific suggestion from Mr. Heim, which which with that, which I thought was a great solution. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thiel. Uh, okay, so at this point, I, I believe there are members of the public who wish to be heard. So why don't we hear from the public and then we'll continue the discussion. The first member, the first, oh, there's quite a few. <laughs> the first person I'm going to promote is John Sambamatsu. Okay. And, and again, while we're promoting the speakers, I would remind everybody um, there is a three minute limit on the presentation. So I'd ask that you um, keep to the three minutes. Thank you so much. Um, could I share my screen briefly? And, and also how much time do I have? Three minutes. Three minutes? Yes. Would you mind starting that once I have permission to share my screen? Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, yeah that's fine. I'll, I'll reset okay. and start when you put your screen up. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Um, so this is kind of a, an amicus brief, uh, as it were, uh, in support of this, these motions, which I think are really, really crucial. I teach animal uh, ethics, among other things, at WPI, and I, I thought that it's really important not to lose sight of the ethical stakes of this. And even if we're only making a statement, I think it's an important statement uh, to make. So uh, in my two and a half minutes, I wanted to just briefly go over some of the reasons why, or the main reasons as I see them, why the town of Arlington should stop killing rats. Uh, you've heard about um, the impact of rodenticides on variety of animals, uh, including domesticated animals. These are, uh, this is a bald eagle, a great uh, horned owl, and a domestic cat who were poisoned, uh, and died because of rat poison. Um, but I really want to focus on this creature here, which is our great, 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 great grandmother. This is where we came from. We are actually mammals, and this is what scientists believe to be the first mammal. So we are related to rats, and our equipage, uh, in terms of our cognition and our feelings come from this little creature and we share with mice, uh, rats, elephants, dogs, and so forth, all mammals, basic uh, structures of consciousness. It was Darwin in 1871 who said this, among other things, that the senses and intuitions, various emotions and faculties such as love, memory, attention, curiosity, imitation, reason, and so forth, of which man boasts, may be found in other species as well. And Darwin believed that um, other animals too exhibit high mental powers, such as the formation of general concepts, self-consciousness, and so forth. And in fact, if we look at qualities of personhood uh, in mammals and in other animals, we find a consistent uh, repertoire of <coughs> behavior, experiences, uh, emotional uh, uh, capacities, 
across the phylogenetic spectrum, okay? And, you know, at the bottom here, I'm going to put in vulnerability to suffering. That's a very, very important one, and that's what the ethicists mostly are concerned about, is how our actions affect others who are vulnerable. Rats are extremely intelligent. They have fantastic memories. Scientists discovered a few years ago that when you tickle them, they laugh, they giggle, uh, they dream at night. Scientists have been able to determine that they dream about what happened uh, to them during the day. Uh, there have been experiments, um, a lot of experiments with rat empathy. They get very distressed when they see another rat suffering, even a stranger, and they will sacrifice their own interests uh, in order to help them. There are a number of initiatives across the country making statements like the one that's been proposed to state authorities whoops, um, for uh, uh, urging a ban on poisons. This is one of the 57 groups and municipalities in California. Um, so just, I have three seconds. This is my summary. It's just wrong uh, to cause excruciating suffering to other beings and to kill our fellow mammals. So I hope the, uh, I support these um, warrants and I hope the select board does too. Thank you. Thank you. Much. The, next mem the next person I will be is Alana Varner. Hello. Good evening. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I just wanted to join you today. Um, I'm originally from Massachusetts, <coughs> but I've um, since been in British Columbia. I have a master's in pest management and have been pursuing my PhD in rodent ecology. Um, so I wanted to lend my expertise today. I've already sent you a written testimony um, outlining um, integrative pest management. <coughs> Um, and I'm sure the um, committee already knows a bit about that. Um, but what I really want to highlight today is the contrast between um, integrative pest management in theory and what's actually been practiced. Um, so in theory, uh, chemicals and pesticides are supposed to be used as the last resort, specifically rodenticides. Um, but in practice, they're often used as a preventative measure um, put out when there is no sign of uh, rodent activity at all. Um, and also in 2015, there was a survey of Massachusetts-based pest management professionals um, showing that many are not aware or underestimate the environmental harms of uh, rodenticide use. So the impacts of this um, are, uh, we, we know some of them are very clear, like death of an individual mammal, um, that's a non-target, um, but some of the impacts have not been studied yet. So the um, population level impacts of a species, for instance, we don't know if that's compromised by this widespread exposure to rodenticides. Um, so what I really like about the uh, proposed articles, um, the uh, first aspect of reporting, um, that will let us get a handle on how much is out there and also help researchers figure out how much is then getting into the mammal non-target populations. Um, that'll be vital information in itself um, and hopefully help prevent uh, the use of uh, rodenticides as a preventative. Um, education, the next point is massive because uh, as that 2015 survey showed, uh, pest management professionals often don't know the harm of the rodenticides they're using. So if you educate the consumer, then you've uh, negated that issue, uh, nipped it in the bud. Um, the third, uh, implementing a IPM policy um, I would love to help in any way I can there, um, as that is my bread and butter. So please feel free to reach out with any questions. Um, and then phasing out rodenticides completely, um, obviously is um, what I support the most, um, if nothing else. Um, yeah, I will conclude there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. The next member of the public is Adam Carse.
Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, for taking the time. My name is Adam Karachi, and I'm going to be coming at this a little bit differently than everyone else here. I am the owner of Pest End Exterminating, and I am also a member of the National Pest Management and New England Pest Management Association. I just wanted to hit on a, a couple of topics that were brought up. Um, first off, what Alana was just talking about was exactly right. Go back to 2015, and there was a lot of people who weren't doing things the way they should have. And if you go back even further than that, we were called baseboard jockeys, and we just sprayed everything we could every time we went. That is not what our industry is anymore. I can tell you personally, between the New England chapter and the national chapter, this topic is talked at nauseum. Um, there is so much training specifically on the proper use of rodenticide and what else we can do to eliminate a rodent problem from a house or a restaurant or a school without using rodenticides. This is a public health concern. Uh, there has been states that have gone through and banned rodenticides and the rodent population has just exploded and it just creates more issues. So I do agree and understand that there needs to be training on all sides. Um, and that's something that I think the towns and the pest control industry need to collaborate on. But I also think it is very difficult when you eliminate uh, a tool from our toolbox that we're no longer allowed to use with a pest that has caused many uh, plagues throughout the, the history of our world. So it's something that I think we just need to be aware of in terms of what we need to make sure that we have available to all of us. Uh, I think the public education is, is very important because as a, a trained professional who's licensed and goes through these courses, I know what I need to do and how to protect the wildlife. The general consumer who can go and buy the same product at the store doesn't. And we all get lumped in together, unfortunately, but there are a lot of times when some of these off target treatments are not performed by professionals. And just on the second part of, of this discussion on the Board of Health, I'm also concerned with the lack of resources that certain departments may have. And if we need to submit written testimony or written descriptions of how we're going to use this to get approval, uh, that can be very overwhelming to the Board of Health. So just to keep that in mind, uh, when we're dealing with, again, restaurants and food uh, supply chains, these are sometimes things that need to be done more quickly. And again, as an owner of a company that we do practice IPM, and we also have a lot of other options that we go to first before rodenticide, there are some times where it is necessary to gain control of a population. Um, so again, I appreciate everything and uh, best of luck with the rest of this discussion. Thank you very much. Laura Kiesel is next. Hi, my name is Laura Kiesel. Um, I've written the select board, but I'm going to also be commenting briefly. It might be a little redundant to what I've said today. Um, over the weekend, I mean. I want to mention that I have a master's degree in natural resources management and sciences. I'm actually going to turn my video off because it's slowing down my thing. Um, and a background in wildlife biology. So to address some of the comments that were just made, um, by, I believe his name was Adam. There is no data that I've been able to find, and I've reported on this issue extensively as an environmental journalist. I could find no data that actually supports that second generation anticoagulant rodenticides are at all effective at reining in rodent populations. There are only a couple of very small studies that exist in laboratory settings for small tropical islands over the short term. There's nothing in, in our kind of environment. Um, there is a lot of data, extensive data on their adverse impacts on wildlife. Um, they have, these rodenticides have failed every single um, EPA ecological assessment they've had over 20 years. They've performed very poorly. Um, and for me, speaking as someone with a wildlife biology background, when you start messing with the predator-prey dynamics, you're gonna artificially inflate the prey species. So rats are very prolific breeders. A single pair can have 2,000 young in one year. 
they can outbreed any poison. Um, but <coughs> their predators, which are more efficient and effective at predating them, they only have two to four chicks a year, say an eagle. And if you wind up extirpating them, you've wiped them out of the area. And then in the absence of those predators, those rodent populations explode. And if you're putting down bait, you're baiting them into the area. And they can build resistance because they're rapidly having so much young that within a few generations, they've built resistance to the poison, whereas their predators do not. So that is why these poisons have not managed to rein them in. Um, also, studies have shown, even though they haven't done causality, um, ESGAR's use has exploded in recent years with rodent populations in the Boston metro area. So there's no indication that the, the exponential rise of these rodenticides have led to a decrease in rodents in the area. Um, I do hope that the select board will consider supporting these warrants. The state preemption, I know, does have some hindering on the ability to phase these out on private properties, but I do think we are completely within our rights to phase these out on municipally owned land and properties, which in turn could help set an example and a precedent for private businesses and residences to take example of. Um, I know when I filed a public records request to look, I was very disheartened to see that we're having a lot of construction and out of the 32 demolition sites we had the past year, 30 of them used these rodenticides. Um, the Board of Health right now requires these lands, these uh, construction sites to have bait stations and though they make no requirement about what's in the bait stations, it kind of incentivizes the use of these rodenticides. So 30 out of 32 used these rodenticides, even though quite a few of them, there was no rodent activity and as um, Alana said earlier, uh, they're not really meant to be used as a preventative. Using them actually can draw rodents into the property. I've also lived in affordable housing in Arlington, and I've actually Excuse had... Excuse me, Ms. Kiesel, if you could just wrap up your... Uh, at about yeah. 3.15. Okay, so just um, just to wrap up, I just want to say that I've been told by, by uh, exterminators that they don't have impacts on wildlife, repeatedly different companies, and that is not... So my experience has not been that there's a lot of responsibility in how they are put down. Thank you for taking my comments. Thank you. The last speaker is Robin Bergman. Hi, can you hear me? Y yes, we can. Good evening. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to keep my camera off because I always have such a bad connection. Um, my name is Robin Bergman. I'm on Park Avenue in Precinct 12. Um, I personally have had two issues with rodenticides myself at my own house in the last six or so months. And I just wanted to point out um, both of them. I went outside with my dog. I have a fenced in yard so that he can run around. He's a puppy, he's a Pomeranian. I noticed that there was a squirrel writhing around on the ground in my backyard. Um, the dog was starting to go after it to try to eat it or pick it up. I got nervous and I brought the dog in. I went out and saw that the, dog, that the squirrel was writhing around in pain and looked like it was really ill. I reached out to the animal control officer who was unavailable. I reached out to all kinds of places. No one could help me, but I eventually did get a hold of the animal control officer who told me that all the symptoms I was seeing was the result of rodenticide poisoning. And she told me to make sure that I kept my dog away from the squirrel until the squirrel perished. It took more than two days for the squirrel writhing around in pain in my backyard to, to die. And so during that time, I could not let my dog out. Fast forward, um, only a couple of weeks ago, um, suddenly my dog brought a dead bird into the house. And I had had an issue, my dog likes to hunt stuff. I had had an issue with the dog trying to eat a bird before that. So I noticed that the bird, thank God the bird, the bird was frozen so that my dog couldn't eat it. But he brought it into the house and it had blood coming out of its mouth. 
and it was obvious to me that it had had rodenticide poisoning. Now, I have no poison anywhere in my house, my yard, anywhere. But I have, I, when I have talked to my neighbors, they're very unaware of what rodenticides do. And I know that I'm in the Heights. I know that there's been a rat problem in the Heights for the last several years. But we have to do something else. Um, you know, this is when I talked to the animal control officer, she told me that a lot of pets are getting poisoned also by eating things out in the yard that have been poisoned with rodenticides. So I just want to also advocate that we definitely need a huge educational campaign. I'd like you to support these warrants. I think it's really important. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's one, more. one more person. Okay. That, yeah, well, we, that, that, that will be it. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be very brief. Sure. Um, we weren't worried about preemption on April 19, 1775. Uh, we, we should push the envelope a little on this as much as we can. The eaglet, the pets, there was a beautiful long-haired black cat on the Arlington cat, uh, A cat list who was dying from rodenticide. We, we've got to do more, and, and I'm very grateful for the folks who put this forward, and, and I hope that the town will do everything it can to go and curb the uh, unwise and unsafe use of this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that concludes the, the public hearing. Any um, comments from Mr. Hurd? Thank you all for the presentation. Um, I think I would say I support everything that this these warrant articles are looking to accomplish. I think this, and if Attorney Heim told us right now that we could pass bylaw and, and ban written sides based on what's been suggested by the proponents, I would support that as well. Um, I'm a little hesitant just because of what has come up with the preemption challenges, but again, I think us as a board with some of these warrant articles whether we pass them, don't pass them, they warrant discussion in town meeting, and I, they could be to avoid the administrative barriers of having to submit an amendment or amend, amended article. I think it's fine. I'm fine passing this through as is recommended and letting town meeting as a complete body decide whether or not they want to send this to the state for review. Um, again, I think this is long overdue. I think there's something that even if it, we can't do anything at the town level, we need to band together to push our state delegation in this direction. I had a very similar uh, experience a couple of weeks ago to Ms. Bergman, where we had a squirrel in our backyard that my six-year-old discovered and ran back inside and they couldn't use the backyard for a while while the squirrel went through what looked like a pretty excruciating process of dying and i don't think that any regardless of what type of animal it is should have to go through that process and i, th I think the main thing that we should take out of this is the public education aspect of it because if you talk to people about banning rodenticides, I think the first question is, well, there's not, well, that's it. That's all, all we have at our disposal is rodenticides in order to fight pest problems, which is not the case. So I think if we can educate the public as to what additional options we have in the toolbox, so we say, and um, there's, there's always more than one solution to a problem, uh, I think that is very beneficial. So I would be... I'm open to other comments from board members where I know there's some concerns about the preemption, but I would be happy to move approval of the recommendations. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, Mr. Helmuth. Yeah, I'm very happy to second that. Um, 
one suggestion I might have, depending on how the rest of my colleagues feel, is if the preemption, state preemption issue is a barrier, that we could, um, assuming, and I'm, I'm going to assume here that this would be in scope under the take under any action related thereto clause of the of the Warren article, that we could suggest a home rule petition instead of the of the preemption. If I mean, I, I like Mr. Hurd's suggestion, but if that would be something that could get us the votes here tonight to move this forward, I'd be open um, to contemplating that myself. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, does the state law, and Mr. Chair, you, I think you can decide whether you want to answer this or, or refer this to town council. Does the, does the preemption restrict uh, uh, the town from enacting regulations for, for, for public town use of these agents or just the private? I'll defer to that to Attorney Hine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What the state law says is the state law is the exclusive authority for regulating the transport, deployment, and use of basically what pesticides, herbicides, rodenticides one can use. Mm -hmm. The issue with respect to the town's property is where the sort of town manager act comes in. Are you saying that the town is the only entity that can't use these things that everybody else can use because the town meeting is going to tell the Conservation Commission, the town manager, the Park and Recreation Commission what they can and can't do over the properties okay. that they have jurisdiction over. So they're slight, they're, they're parallel things, okay. uh, but, but but the, the long and short of it is what I am hearing from the proponents is that they're proposing a Warren article that would phase out uh, second generation anticoagulants, uh, that would create a licensing and registration scheme, and that would encourage, I think through the resolution, I could be wrong about this, that the manager develop a policy of integrated pest management for town properties, which is my understanding of how they're navigating the, the town manager part of the issue. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, and I, and I just would further note that I think that, you know, I was, I was impressed that uh, working on this, that there's a safety valve of sorts, you know, that the Board of Health can, can still permit SCARs if they feel a public health situation warrants that. And I think that's a, a realistic, you know, compromise in, in this that gives me more comfort in pushing for a phase out. You know, I, frankly, I think that I have real questions and actually pretty persuaded that, that just in terms of effectiveness of the goal of control, controlling problematic rat problems when, when they exist, that not eliminating the, the natural predators um, is the way to do it. We have, uh, I've been observing a pair of great horned owls in our tr neighboring trees, and it's, it's a magnificent thing, and they're working for us. <laughs> and I want, you know, I want that to happen, and I think that, you know, I have, um, I think there's a reasonable path forward we can do this. The legal questions need to be resolved, but I personally favor uh, pushing on this. I think on the town side, the town managers inform me that, you know, the town is already there and in practice that we have an IPM strategy in place, um, you know, and, and it, this is an opportunity to correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding from our conversations is that, you know, that the restrictions would not present any practical problems for the town with the safety valve in place with the Board of Health. Is that, is that true? Yeah, that, that is correct, Mr. Helmer. And I think it's important for the public to understand that the town is already taking good leadership on this. That, um, the town manager policy right now, and I'm, and I'm happy for the for the resolution on this. Um, you know that that is what we're doing. That we are trying very hard, as for to the extent the town has control, not to use these agents. Um, so um, so that's where I am, and I would refer to the rest of my colleagues on how you might want to handle the vote. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Anything further, um, Mr. Diggins? Okay, so um, I, I think I mean, I'm fine with things. I'm just trying to understand. So then the the Article 18 is going to be. Uh, bylaw change where that does what? I mean, it's just going to um, require registration, you know, or license, license application? Well, as proposed, and I'll turn it over to Attorney Hyman, there's three components to the proposed bylaw. Um, Attorney Hyman, if you could summarize. I don't want to speak for the proponents, but my understanding is that they're proposing a bylaw that identifies, prob probably in public health and safety, uh, uh, chapter that would propose to a require pest management companies to register in Arlington to operate which right. we believe they can do number two that they would have to report the deployment of second generation anticoagulant rodenticides anytime that they're using them so the town could essentially have a database and potentially like a map of where they've been deployed and then three, the part that we're sort of debating a little bit is propose the phase out of all use of second generation uh, rodenticides in Arlington. Um, 
that part of it could be done in a bylaw where maybe it gets rejected. I'm not going to say maybe. I think it probably gets rejected by the Attorney General's office, and I think what Mr. Teal has outlined is that does that rejection provide an opportunity for an appeal or some sort of negotiation of some kind? Um, the other possibility, I think Mr. Helmuth has noted, that you could try to achieve a similar thing by uh, passing special legislation on that specific score and keeping it out of the bylaw. And then finally, the resolution that accompanies this, the article, is it 77? 77 yes. Yes. is saying, hey, uh, we want to make sure it's very clear to the town manager and these other entities that control property to some differing degrees in Arlington that we want you to use integrated pest management. And I think everybody's understanding is the town manager is extremely receptive to that and already has a practice in place that may be informed and tweaked in some ways as suggested by the proponents. So right, that's, that's my you. understanding. Okay, right, thank you. I, I think what's going on in my mind is that I was getting the third component of that in um, requiring the promotion of integrated, of IPM <coughs> in, as, as part of the, um, the resolution, but this would apply to um, companies that are using pesticides in town? No? In town it's, land. Town land. Yeah, the resolution is... is no, not the that. resolution. I'm sorry to interrupt. Not the resolution point three of, of 18. I mean, so requiring oh, okay. the, the requiring and promoting IPM as a best practice and providing for educational opportunities regarding the same. That's for... That's, that's for uh, the public. It's for the public. And okay. The public and, and uh, considering construction workers and, and folks like that as, as members of the public, uh, the idea is that, that uh, the education can best happen at those intersections between the public and town functions like licensing and permitting and inspectional inspections that happen. Okay, I'm just um, I'm trying to understand where does that, so who, the town does require me, requiring, and that's enforced where or when, when they, on, on the, 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 the resolution, Mr. What? Diggins? No, it's not the resolution piece. I mean, so I'm, I'm fine with the resolution piece. I think I got that. That's in 77. Okay. And that involves what the town manager does you know, with, with respect to town property. I mean, but at the third point of the article uh, 18, uh, which is going to go into the bylaw, um, requires requiring or promoting IPM as best practice for providing for educational opportunities regarding the same. I, I, I think Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. 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 Uh, uh, chair, um, I think what we're, what we're looking at doing there, and honestly the town is already doing it in large part, uh, is simply encouraging continued education efforts. And uh, in fact, the Board of Health has a webinar in a few days uh, on this topic that we're really looking forward to. And, and you know, one, one thing that was really amazing to me is as we navigate this process is not only did everyone in town leadership already know about this issue and already care about this issue, but they're already working on it. Um, so I, I think we, we wanted to incorporate the educational piece as well, um, just because as other speakers have said, that really is the heart of this in so many ways. Um, but I, I, I would say in terms of a change uh, from today versus, you know, post-passage of these warrant articles, that, that is the piece that, that is, not to say least consequential, but, but you know, has, has less, um, you know, less of a tangible, uh, you know, skeleton around it, if that makes sense. But it's yeah, simply a requirement, or it's simply a requirement for, for the town to continue doing the educational work they're, they're already doing. It is already Hey. All right, thanks. I guess it'll all get flushed out in the, in the main motion when we finally see it. So thank you. Thank okay. you. I'm, I'm, I'm on board with the whole concept. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I keep stepping on you. Sorry about that. No, no, sorry about that. Attorney Heim, I think, wanted to add something. Yeah, if I could just right. make this very clear for everybody. Thank right. you, Mr. Chairman. I think what the proponents are contemplating is, like we do in a lot of different bylaws, there's sometimes a statement of why we're, why we're doing this. And one of the things that might be a part of that statement is, you know, it's the town's, you know, uh, belief that, you know, secular generation... Uh, you know, rodenticides pose a health risk to the public and wildlife and, you know, encourages the use of alternatives wherever possible. And then you'd have the meat of the bylaw saying, this is what the regulation says. Okay. I see. Thank, thank, thank you. you. I guess I was interpreting, requiring a little literally. Thank you. I appreciate it.
Okay. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, yeah, so just a, a comment on, based on what Mr. Helmuth has said, I, I, I see a little bit of an analogy here with what we did last year with the, the real estate tax transfer where we sought special legislation. There's also a local option pending in the legislature for that. And, and, and here, to me, I don't see the point of trying to do this through a bylaw. I do see the point of trying to do this through special legislation. One is a means to get the legislature's approval, but two, also to send a message that maybe House 910 should be approved, and to the extent that other communities are trying to do this, maybe that gives a little momentum towards that. So um, listening to, to what you said, Mr. Helmuth, and, and Attorney Himes' answer, I, I'd be comfortable parsing that out as a separate piece of special legislation and going along with the bylaw for um, two and three, because I think from, from what we heard from Attorney Heim, that probably would pass review, and it seems like that's the best way to, to acknowledge that the legislature regulates in this area, but to ask them um, to allow us to do it. Uh, Mr. Hurd? Yep, I just, would just say, um, to, the, to the extent it needs clarification, I'll extend, I'll amend my motion as just suggested by the chair. Okay. Yeah, Attorney Hunt, does that, I don't know if you have any comments on Mr. Chair, going I down think, that road. I think what I'm hearing, uh, I could be wrong, please correct me, but is that we'd essentially have uh, a multi-part vote that essentially says by law with respect to items two and three, special legislation with respect to the phase out of uh, these rodenticides, and then finally a resolution, albeit under Article 77, to support uh, and encourage integrated pest management for right. town property. Well said. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and I would second that amendment as well. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So on, I, I believe we're we're at a spot where we're ready to vote. So on a um, motion, I have this a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. This would cover both Articles 18 and 77. Uh, Attorney Hein. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Okay. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next is Article 27, uh, Revolving Funds. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Chapdelin, you're going to present on that? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so this is the annual article where the board votes to send forward to town meeting the authorized amounts uh, within revolving funds that we can spend up to. So the town comptroller working with the deputy town manager prepared both the, um, the vote language that puts the voting caps in place as well as the addendum language which the board had established quite a few years ago now that provides greater detail about the expenditures within each fund that goes at the back of the select board's report. Um, those were actually added to Novus today. Um, I, think, I think this year they're, they're fairly straightforward. Some of the larger accounts have been slower because of the pandemic, though we expect them to rebound, uh, hopefully, um, in the coming year. Uh, but happy to answer any questions, but would ask for your favorable action on this tonight. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chaptolin. Any? Move approval. Okay. Second. Okay. Any comments from board members? I don't see any. Uh, any members of the public wish to be heard? Not at this time, Okay, so in a motion uh, for approval by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Okay. Uh, next is Article 47, Endorsement of Parking Benefit District Expenditures. I believe Mr. Chapdelaine. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we're, we're actually putting one final refinement on the spreadsheet and should be ready by Wednesday night. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, so we have a motion to table that? For so moved. Okay. A second? A second. Okay. It's a motion to table until Wednesday, uh, made by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Uh, yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next is Article 75, Proposed Resolution, Commitment to Increase Diversity in Town Appointments. I believe Ms. Dre is going to make a presentation on that.
Good evening. Thank good, you for the invitation. To good evening, tonight. Ms. Trey. I was off by about a half an hour, but uh, here we are. <laughs> Just right up, I've been watching the UConn game. They're in double overtime, triple overtime. So I'm out of breath from running upstairs, so it was fine with me. Thanks. Okay. All right. Go right ahead. Um, great. Elizabeth Trey, uh, town meeting member in Precinct 10. I am uh, wanted to thank you for inviting me to be here tonight. I'm here to ask for your support of the resolution to increase diversity in town appointments. Um, as the select board well understands, resolutions are not only a public statement of a town's values, but also of a town's aspirations. Recent examples are the land acknowledgement and the honoring of Indigenous Peoples Day and Prince Hall Day. This resolution serves to focus our attention on our commitment to building a community where everyone is heard, respected, and protected. And it's another tool for, the, our, for our diversity, equity, and inclusion toolkit. It asks the pointing authorities to identify and actively break down the barriers that maintain the status quo and prevent us from benefiting from the rich diversity of experiences, perspectives, and ideas found in our community. And furthermore, it intentionally creates space in our public bodies for people from typically underrepresented groups. This resolution is just one tool that we can use to create committees and boards that more accurately reflect the diversity of Arlington residents. This resolution is supported by the Arlington's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Division, Envision Arlington Standing Committee, and Envision Arlington's Diversity Task Group. Arlington has repeatedly affirmed its commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Most recent, recently, you voted, um, you acknowledged that our public bodies do not reflect the true and rich diversity of our town, and you demonstrated your commitment to tackling this challenge by voting to approve the DEI director's proposal for an equity audit, in part to identify barriers to access and engagement, and with the goal of bringing unheard voices to the table. The results of that audit a year from now will provide a roadmap for Arlington to follow. This resolution is a tool that will support that effort as we wait for the results. Increasing diversity in our public bodies was so important to the select board last fall that it voted to significantly redraw, re redraw precinct boundaries to create a political landscape with the specific goal of increasing the diversity of town meeting. This resolution builds upon that work with the same goal, but in our broader public bodies. And it asks that special attention be paid to the goal of identifying and breaking down the barriers that inhib inhibit diversity just as you did with your votes to redraw town meeting precincts. It asks that when appointing authorities have two qualified candidates for public bodies, that they consider diversity and representation of underrepresented residents in making their final decision. Arlington's DEI director, Jillian Harvey, identified barriers to access that include outreach, engagement, and education. And while there are no quick fixes, she believes that one possible solution is to begin to build relationships with community and religious groups and ask them to spread the word in their networks and to keep positions open for a set amount of time before closing the application process. Resident education could include topics such as why resident engagement is important, how it benefits both the individual and the community, how our town government works, and how to learn about and apply for open positions. And appointing authorities should be encouraged to consider lived experience along with professional qualifications. In preparation for this evening, I sent a brief survey out to chairs of public bodies um, asking them about their experience with diversity. I'd like to thank the, the chairs of the 14 groups who responded for taking their time to help me tonight. While the committees who responded were diverse, there were some very interesting commonalities and the overwhelming majority said that they would like to have more diverse boards. They also identified similar barriers that, to access that aligned with Ms. Har Harvey's observations. Common themes were the lack of a development of a pipeline for them to recruit from, the need to focus on educating residents about the importance of volunteer work and how much this town depends on volunteers, and that many residents don't know where to look for openings or how to apply for them. The chairs understood, understood that for many of them, using their personal networks to find new members, while effective, often contributes to the lack of diversity. There was also an agreement that volunteers need, amongst, amongst other things, the luxury of time, sometimes topic-specific knowledge, perhaps <laughs> childcare, transportation, and the energy to take on additional work that's uncompensated. The survey shed a light on another barrier, which is the lack of a standardized and transparent recruitment process in Arlington. The vast majority of groups limit their outreach to the town's website and their personal networks. 
Several say that the appointing authority does all the outreach and selection, and only two groups conduct the outreach and selection on their own, and then ask the appointing authority to approve it. And only two groups do media outreach beyond the town's emails and websites. Diversity in our public bodies will benefit Arlington in many ways. It will make Arlington more welcoming and inclusive to a broader swath of residents, which may lead to increased diversity of those who choose to live, work, or own a business here. In addition, research shows that diverse teams are often more innovative, productive, engaged, and are better problem solvers. There will likely be long-term benefits to engaging a wider group of residents to serve on our public bodies. Membership on those boards and committees is often an on-ramp to further political engagement. Today's committee members may be tomorrow's town meeting members and maybe to, maybe to select board members eventually. And this will help achieve the select board's reprecinting goals of a more diverse town meeting. This engagement is especially important as town meeting members decline running for re-election as many have done this year. While lack of diversity in public bodies is a concern shared by many here in Arlington, it is not a unique challenge. Boston is working on closing similar opportunity gaps and Somerville recently announced a new initiative to create a standardized process for recruiting community members that is inclusive and transparent. There are no easy answers and Arlington is taking steps to improve diversity, yet progress is slow. This resolution focuses on the one group that is uniquely positioned to most quickly move the town towards meeting this goal, Arlington's appointing authorities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Stray. Uh, any questions for Ms. Stray at this time? Oh, okay, why don't, why don't we see if there's any public comments? At this time, there are no hands raised. Okay, all right, I'll turn to the board. Mr. Diggins. All right, so, um, so I would like to um, move positive action on this. And do you, Mr. Chair, have um, a few questions um, sure. for Mr. Yep, Trey? Right uh, thank you. Uh, so um, so first off, I mean, uh, well, two requests. I mean, one is, if possible, I'd love to see that survey, um, the survey results um, from the committees. I mean, uh, that, that sounds um, very interesting, fascinating. Uh, and second, uh, uh, I believe what you said about diversity making for stronger groups also. Uh, but if you have any recent research on that, I'm also interested in that. I mean, uh, I can go look at it myself, but if you have something handy, I mean, I'm always interested in that, especially if it's um, something peer reviewed as opposed to uh, a business review, because it's the, the business review stuff, I mean, I find to be a little weak on the, um, the methodology. They tend to be more case studies. You know? So that's just a request. I mean, if you have it and or if you find it and can send it, I'd appreciate it. Uh, the, other, uh, the other thing is more of a um, kind of a question comment. It, um, so in a town, me that is two percent black. It um, me. Do you think it is enough to simply go for me representation in proportion mm -hmm. to the population, or do you feel that you need to maybe aim higher than that? Me so that me there's more of a chance of people seeing me, you know people of color. Me, you know, and so I, I'm sorry I use black as kind of a, a shortcut. You know, but if you just need to kind of me maybe aim higher so that people then see. Um, what um, see see themselves. I mean, because um, uh, if you just aim for the percentage, then it's going to be pretty low. And, and you can walk into a room, I mean, and then you know, like there's a hundred people in it, and there are only two black people. And people say, "Well, all the black people." What's well, like? Well, really, that's all there is in terms of percentage. I mean, and so you kind of need more. I mean, what do you think of that? Just comment, you know. Well, I mean, I I would love to see boards have a, a wide variety of representation, um, and even just be, beyond race, like. You know, I think that there's boards need to have a variety of voices on um, on the housing experience, right? Renters versus homeowners. Um, you your age, right? Seniors are going to have different perspectives and needs than young families or or people who live here without children. Um, gender identity. I think there's so much more um, rep diversity in Arlington that goes even beyond race. Um, but to get back to your original point, I would love to see a huge number of uh, people of different races on different committees, because um, I think that's representation is really important. And so, I, so just a couple of questions. So when evaluating how successful um, we may be in this or what our shortfall is, I mean, do we look at the composition of the committees in the aggregate so that we, we then like put all the members together and, and look mm -hmm. at it that way uh, to see how how we compare to the population in town? 
My first re response would be no, because I think it's really important to have a variety of voices on on a variety of different topics, right? If we put everybody in the same room on one particular topic, we're getting we're losing um, those perspectives uh, on 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 trees, on open spaces, on transportation. We need to have the voices integrated into all areas of of Arlington and all topics. I got it. Because then we're kind of back to that kind of math issue, though, right? Because if you have the the let's say five slots on the tree committee. Let's say seven slots in the tree committee, I mean, then you have only 2% black in town. I mean, you're just not, chances are you're not going to get that on the tree committee, but you see what I'm getting at, kind of? Yeah, but we can get other kinds of diversity on okay. on, on the groups too. You okay. know, we, it, it, I think that there's, um, it's not, I think it's not realistic to, to say that we're only going to be successful when we have a lot of, um, Asian residents or black residents serving on boards. Okay, gotcha. I understand where you're coming from. Because I also think that those other voices are important. Gender identity, sexual orientation, your housing tenure. Those are also diversity that needs to be brought to the table. Whenever we're talking about these groups, we need to have the people at the table making the decisions mm -hmm. that affect us all. Right, gotcha. And so uh, a couple of suggestions. One is that we, uh, Regards to what happens to the resolution, I, mean, I think one of the solutions that we can have I mean, for us getting more diversity is the way that we construct I mean, the the bylaws I mean, the, or whatever creates these committees. I mean, and so we can we can instruct I me mean, how the members are selected. I mean, so for instance, I me mean, the PCAF study group I mean, yeah. I mean, that had selection that was done by groups as opposed to I me mean, one or two people. I mean, and, and as you may see with the um, hopeful um, youth um, and young adult um, board collaborative. I mean, that's going to be done kind of rent by by lottery, at least initially. I mean, um, and, and and so uh, um, and it's spread out uh, uh, across all 21 precincts. I mean, and 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 so there's just ways that we can kind of increase the chances that it doesn't get c controlled by being a small number of people uh, and. Uh, the last is um, uh, if there's any way this civic engagement group can help in this process, you know where we are. And so. Thank you. And I do think PCAPS is a, was a great example of a creative way to ensure diversity of, of different perspectives onto a committee. And I think that's a great model to follow if possible for, for, future, for future groups. And yes, I think the, the, the CEG has a lot on his plate, but I, I'm happy to work on this because I think it's important. Well, the more people we have at CEG, the more we can take on. So, that so good. We, we outreach to do more outreach. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Okay, thank, you. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, Mr. Hurd? Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Dre, for the presentation. I'm happy to support this resolution. Um, I think this, what this resolution does is really state something that the town has been engaged in for the past number of years, at least the years that I have been on the board under the guidance of this board, our town manager and our DAI director, Jillian Harvey and her staff. So I think these are ongoing efforts that we've are currently engaged in, but I'm happy to reiterate our commitment to increasing diversity on town boards. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Was that a second, Mr. Hurd? I think yeah, I, yeah yep. I took that a second. Yes. Um, and I'm very happy to support this as well. I might suggest um, in, in our uh, refinement of the resolution, I think it, it looks good to me, but um, we might, the board might want to contemplate um, refining its, the description of its motivation on the precincting. Mm -hmm. Um, and also maybe slightly expanding the acknowledgement, which I appreciate of the town's existing work, but I'm thinking particularly of um, adding personnel to, to assist director Harvey in, in the effort. Um, and I'm really, ha really happy that the intent of this is to do a lot of things, but including support the equity audit. I think that is a really important initiative. I think Director Harvey has made that a very persuasive case for why that is a really crucial step for us, even though we have a lot of changes going on this year. Um, I think this resolution and town meeting, putting this in front of town meeting will be helpful to keep that um, at top of mind, along with everything else we have to keep top of mind. So um, those are just my suggestions on the final form of this. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, 
Yeah, and, and I, I was going to say something on that, too. Thunder, sorry. No, 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 not at all. I'm glad you brought it up. It, it, it just, and it's just a little bit of words. Um, it, it, the way it reads now, it, it was our specific goal. It, it was one of the, the considerations that we had, but we'll, we'll work on language on that. That just is a small item in the overall uh, proposed resolution. I want to thank you, Ms. Dre, for bringing this to us, but also working with town council because I know this started a little differently and what's been brought to us is a resolution that I think um, you know, town meeting can, can, can take action on and, and it's an appropriate uh, form to do that. So thank you very much for that. Um, so on a um, motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Hey, thank you, thank you, Mr. Drake. Did, now, did you did UConn win the game or? Yes, they did. They pulled it out by three. Okay, over South Carolina. Good. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for your time this evening. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, so next, that completes the Warren article hearings for this evening. I think that we're just about done with them as well. There's a couple of stragglers, but uh, um, final votes and comments and. Um, Attorney Heim, you had sent us, we didn't vote on this last time because of the, the lateness, but there was um, some proposed votes that you already sent to us, and I don't know if you want to summarize that for us. It, it's been sent to us in our packets. Sorry, Mr. Yeah, sorry. Corsi. Thank you. So you've got um, votes and comments on Article 6. Thank you, Mr. Chair, sorry. Article 6, uh, updating the Human Rights Commission bylaw. Um, Quite sure. Article 8, the Civilian Advisory uh, uh, Commission, which I think, um, I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, which you had previously talked about, um, but we were waiting for some further discussion points on that. Article 9, which is, sorry. <laughs> Can I see that list for a second? My apologies. Article 9, which was the uh, net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Um, 11, uh, the revised domestic partnerships. Uh, we also submitted as new ones 12, the single use. I'm sorry, the revised domestic partnership wasn't ready. I apologize. We needed to look at the tape to make sure we understood the discourse there a little bit. But we have single use plastic water bottles, um, conversion of gas uh, dispensing pumps to self service. Uh, Magliozzi Boulevard, and Mr. Slickman sent me a nice note correcting that both Magliozzi's Magliozzi lived in Arlington, so I will fix that. It wasn't just one. Um, and then code enforcement, overnight parking impacts, early voting in town elections, endorsement of CDBG, and resolution on true net zero. I guess what my suggestion would be, Mr. Chair, is if the board wants to flag which ones it would like to have a more robust discussion on. If there are other things that there are like administrative amendments to be made, I'd be happy to receive those from board members uh, individually if they're not like substantive changes. If there's a typo that you noticed or something, that you, just like a word change from that to which or something like that. Um, so if you guys want to just identify the ones, maybe we could read them off again and if you guys want to almost like hold them for discussion. Yeah, okay. That I, makes sense? Yeah, I think that's, that, that, that's fine because there's, there's going to be a few of them that I think that we can approved this evening, but some others we may, may, we may need more discussion. So why don't we do that? And uh, Attorney Heim will read them. If there's anybody who wants to hold it for further discussion, we can do that. Otherwise, we will uh, vote final approval. Okay. Article 6, uh, updating the Human Rights Commission bylaw. Article 8, Civilian hold. Police Advisory okay. Commission. There's a hold on that one. Okay. Article 9, achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions from town facilities. Article 11. Nope, sorry, strike that. Article 12, single-use plastic water bottle regulation. Um, yeah, why don't we hold that one? I just want to... Uh, Article 17, conversion of gas station dispensing pumps to self-service. Article 19, uh, street name Magliozzi Boulevard, understanding that... Hold. Are, okay. Huh? Article 20, code enforcement. Article 22... Town Committee on Overnight Parking Impacts, Article 25, Home Rule Legislation and Early Voting, 
Article 26, CDBG. Article 73, True Net Zero. Okay, that's all. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, Mr. Diggins, I, I was just going to summarize for a second, and then uh, the, the, I, I had holds on 8, 12, and 19. Okay, okay. all right. Okay. All right, any further no, comments? Do we have a motion? Just, just oh. a question on the ones that are held. Are we anticipating that we'll vote those Wednesday night? I, I hope so. I, I, because we have to, like, when do we have to go to the printer and get everything done? I know we keep putting things. Uh, my understanding is, is just that you're holding these for discussion. If you're ready to tell me specifically how you want to fix them tonight, they'll be done. But if you want to have further discussion on Wednesday night, I, I understand what you're saying, Ms. Mond. Yeah. I, I, I was almost thinking there may be a need to, for members to even get back to you and, and have a final vote on Wednesday as, as opposed to having oh. a discussion tonight. On. Okay. Yeah, because the, what my understanding is, with the exception of those three, we want to vote final comments on okay. everything else, but then we get to vote those three along with what we here tonight. Um, right, and, and, and I was thinking there may be a desire to, to, to have a discussion, and, and, and maybe we can all take a further look at it and then yeah. no, I'll no, put no. it on the agenda for Wednesday as yeah. opposed to doing it right now. That's fine, because we, we had it and it was on last week. Right. And then we could have done what we're doing now, but we're not. So as long as they're voted by Wednesday night, I'm just trying to clean up. Yeah. Okay. So please, whatever. <laughs> okay. So so if I could have a motion. Oh, Mr. Helmuth, did you? Yeah, no, go ahead. Ask, ask your motion. Yeah, I was going to ask for a motion on the ones that we didn't hold. For, for So moved. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. All right. Um, any further discussion? Okay. So on a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan and Mr. Hurd. Uh, it was a tie. I couldn't tell. <laughs> uh, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. I think Mrs. Mahan has seniority in a tie. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Okay. Great. All right. So that. Um, yeah, Mr. Helmuth. So, um, and, and this is, I think, at the chair's discretion and my colleagues. Uh, I know that for Article Eight, I had just one very small clarification that uh, be prepared to explain tonight. I believe my colleague, Mr. Diggins, um, sent, us, sent around a, um, you know, an addition to our comment, but not in the vote. Um, so, you know, we could do that Wednesday night if you want to. I think it's just a question of how, how we want to spend the time tonight versus Wednesday. I know we have a, you know, full plate on Wednesday as well. But, um, okay. I, I, would, I, I don't have a strong feeling either way. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, what I was thinking is, I, I don't know, if just to revisit these, these other votes, I felt like might be good for everybody to take a further look at sure. them, and then, and then I will uh, make time for it on, on Wednesday. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. All right. So that uh, leads us to new business. Uh, Ms. Marr? No new business. Attorney Heim? Uh, very briefly, Mr. DeCourcy, the special town meeting warrant opened and closed today. Uh, the ARB had three articles. You have a very small number of articles that we will need to schedule. They are on fairly straightforward things, including a takings for safe routes to school, which has to be approved by the select board. And um, potentially, we've discussed this quite a bit publicly about whether or not we'll be ready to have a discussion about Arlington Great Meadows for town meeting, or we're just going to have a discussion with some members of the Conservation Commission. But, other than that, the special town meeting warrant is pretty light for the select board, so we're really talking about one to two articles to be added to your slate. Okay, thank you. And that, that's within the annual town meeting. And um, just while you mentioned it, is, is Great Meadows, is that going to be on Wednesday night or no? I don't believe so. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Chapterling? No new business today. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Helm? No new business. Thank you. Mr. Hurd? I just wanted to report, I'm sure at some point we'll get a report from TAC on this, but the first, as you might remember, the, the Dallin School, we voted a couple of weeks ago a, uh, a new pickup and drop off procedure. And so far, from my perspective, it's been a wild success and really has increased safety. So just an initial glimpse, I think it's, it's been really successful. So I want to do thank everyone that, that was involved in putting that together. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins? I'm going to do this. Thank you. Okay, I, I have two brief items, and, and I meant to bring this on up last time, but because of the late hour, did want to congratulate the Arlington High School girls hockey team for making the state final. Uh, unfortunately, they lost to Austin Prep, but they had uh, up until about two and a half minutes left in the game. It was a two to one game, 
and they had lost to them earlier in the season, I did believe six to one here in Arlington. So they gave them a great game and uh, they had a fantastic season. So congratulations to the girls hockey team. The other thing, I had a March Madness theme earlier uh, this year is talking about WPI and RPI. But for those of you who watched the men's tournament, uh, the University of Miami had a really great run. They made it to the Elite Eight. They just got knocked out yesterday, losing to North Carolina. Bensley Joseph, who grew up in Arlington, is a member of that team. He's a freshman, um, plays uh, for them. He's a point guard, and I wanted to congratulate Bensley on an outstanding season and, and for playing um, in, in the national tournament on the Division I level. It's quite an accomplishment. He actually played at Arlington High for a couple of years um, before he left Arlington High School, but grew up in Arlington, started in the town travel program back in fifth grade, and uh, he's on Miami, and uh, they had a great run and uh, were really fun to watch. The bubble burst, unfortunately, for them yesterday, um, but uh, they had a great season, so congratulations to Bensley. With that, I will uh, take a motion to adjourn. So moved. A second. Second. Okay, motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Thank you. Stand us forward. Good night, everyone.